Well, I'm glad we got it. I'm glad we got it worked out. Hey, Brian. So glad and happy that you're able to uh, join us here. This week. Um, and again, in case you missed last night's icebreaker, we're going to just um, take a little time in just a bit to go over the agenda once again and some of the logistics for the PD. So no worries. Uh, if you've got questions, you can type those in the chat box for Brian or myself, and we'll be sure to help you out with anything you need. Um, as you know, we're going to kick things off now. So I'd like to introduce you to our director of the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida, Dr. Bruce McFadden. Uh, he's going to set the stage for us this week. So Bruce, I'm gonna turn things over to you now and you can take it away. Thanks very much, Stephanie and Brian, and to all of you who are here today. And for those of you who participated last night in the icebreaker, I really had a lot of fun and enjoyed it and got and enjoyed getting to meet people. So that was really good. Um, OK, so uh, Brian asked me to make some some uh, sort of higher level remarks about the, the Scientist Interview Florida School Program, how it was funded and where we're going in the next 10 years. So that's sort of, I'll spend about five minutes on that and we'll be good to go. I think, there we go. Okay, thanks. So yeah, welcome to our third annual Scientist in Every Florida School Teacher Professional Development. We've developed a culture in our institute that these professional developments are usually the second week in July. And each of the Preview, each of the professional developments is themed around a topic of relevance to Florida Earth Systems. And that's because the institute that the Scientists in Every Florida School is part of, the Thompson Earth Systems Institute, or TESI, is dedicated to furthering understanding of uh, Florida, uh, or actually the Earth's air, water, land, and life. And, and, and also human inter interactions and how, they, uh, how we affect the natural systems of the earth. In 2019, our first professional development in July was an in-person event uh, focused on the life in the biosphere. Last year, we had an all virtual event, which we had to pivot and plan from a previous in-person uh, planning session. And that was on the nature of science. And this year, we felt with everything going on in Florida water with sea level incursions, red tide, et cetera, we felt that we wanted to talk this year about Florida water or the hydrosphere. So that's the, the, a little bit about the thematic background. Of our, of our teacher professional development. And we're, as I said, we're very pleased to have our third teacher PD. And as I said, if you would go back, please. There you go. Okay. Um, I, was, I was really glad to see so many people on the, the, the meet and greet last night the virtual meet and greet. In the past, we've had the meet and greets when we had it in person at a brew, uh, a brew pub in Gainesville. And that I have to admit, that's a way that's that's a lot of fun, a lot more fun than doing a virtual icebreaker. But be that as it may, um, sixty more than sixty of us attended that half an hour meeting last night, and that was a really great way to break the ice. So it was great to see you and to meet some of you. Next, please. Okay, so. Um, so Brian said, you know, we're going to talk about the details of the steps during during the PD. And why don't you, Bruce, as director, just talk about sort of the, the, the broad overview of the project, why we're doing it, how it got funded, and where we're going with it. So three months after our institute got uh, cre was created by an uh, endowment, from some supporters from Florida, the Thompsons. So three months after we had a, an institute that was very young in its development and the University of Florida president um, made a call for um, grants to uh, teams of UF faculty that could, uh, which were called moonshots. Now, most of you are younger than I am, or, or I'm older than most of you. And I remember in the early 1960s, when I was a teenager, I remember that President Kennedy came on the TV and also gave a, gave a, gave a talk to Congress and at Rice University, and it's his famous moonshot speech. And the, he, he, challenged the univer, uh, the, he challenged the United States to put a person on the moon by the end of the 1960s, by the end of the decade. And this, this was a seemingly unattainable goal. We didn't have the science and technology infrastructure in 1962 to do this, but he said, let's get together and make this happen through innovation of technology and science. And sure enough, as you all know, in 1969, um, 
the first person did land on the moon. And that was a result of incremental growth and innovation in the science and technology infrastructure. But if you, th if you thought about it in 1962, to put a person on the moon uh, was, was really a seemingly unattainable task. And then the process was initiated to move the infrastructure towards the goal of getting the person on the moon. These have also been called game changers. The president of the university challenged our faculty with moonshot competitions to propose something to propose something that would be a game changer for the state of Florida and our future. So 16 proposals were, were submitted for this UF president's moonshot competition in September 2018. And ours was one of either eight or nine that was funded by this, by this initiative. And we entitled it a scientist in every Florida school. And our vision, next slide, please. Our vision for the, oops, I'm sorry, there. Our vision for the scientists in every Florida school is that a decade from now, we envision that scientists from the University of Florida and other Florida scientists as well from our program will visit every K-12 school in every Florida district at least once a year. That's a huge lift. Uh, uh, Stephanie, can we go back? Okay, that's a huge lift. Um, you wanna put in the chat, how many public schools are there in Florida? Anybody know? If you think you know how many, if you know how many public schools there are in, in, the, in the 67 counties in Florida, put it in the chat. Okay, so yeah, 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 Wendy. Okay, we're getting, we're getting, we're, getting, we're increasing that. Yeah, Wendy, so there's, 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 there's about 4,000 public schools in Florida. So getting a scientist in all Florida, all 4,000 public schools is a seemingly unattainable task, similar to Kennedy's moonshot. Nevertheless, uh, when you start with these big projects, you have to work incrementally. And the project that we got funded from the University of Florida president was a pilot study that was originally focused on five counties with in-person visits. And then COVID changed everything. So for the past year and a half, we've been doing all of our visits virtual. And over the past year, we've had, we've had more, about 2,000 virtual classroom and teacher visits uh, into Florida public schools. And we, we now, we've been running all of our programs like today's PD virtually. So we've learned a lot. Uh, we're moving in the direction of being able to scale up to reach the seemingly unattainable goal a decade of, uh, from now of getting a scientist in every Florida school. And once we reach those goals, we hope to have some major strategic outcome, outcomes that will be game changers in terms of the future of public education, public K-12 education in our state. And these are listed in the next slide, Stephanie. Thanks. So a decade from now, we envision that Florida, that as a result of, of our efforts with the scientists in every Florida school program, we'll have Florida K-12 teachers better trained about earth systems and the environment and human impacts. We also uh, will, we also, I'd like to say pride ourselves or hope that we uh, deliver statewide high quality teacher professional development presented as a process and not just a one-off event. And in so doing, we're developing longstanding relationships that, uh, that form a scientist teacher network, which now numbers more than a thousand teachers and more than 750 scientists working throughout the state. We hope to be able to, with additional mentoring and coaching, this is a new, a new thing we'd like to work on, uh, help to improve teacher retention in, in Florida's public school through early, particularly in, in early and mid-career STEM teachers. We've started a scientist in resident, a full-time scientist in resident program in Marion County. That's been uh, extraordinarily successful. We reached 100% of the, all the schools in Marion County and many of the schools in adjacent Levy County. And we would love to continue the scientist in, in residence program in selected counties as it made sense. Of course, if you talk to any principal or district official, what, what they're going to want to say is, all this sounds really good, but 
at the end of the day, has what you're doing improved student achievement in STEM? So we want to be able to track and evaluate and assess whether we've improved student achievement, which is something that we envision doing over the next decade, and also allowing those students to better understand uh, 21st century skills and in so doing 21st century STEM career and workforce preparation. And we also are committed to, as part of our vision, to let everyone know that if they want every student know that if they want to, they can, they too can be a scientist. So I just like to have a couple of thank yous and then we can move on. Okay. Um, so in terms of our supporters and partners, I'd like to, to um, thank uh, other UF University of Florida departments, centers and institutes for their, their participation in uh, or for actual for donations. So the, the department, we thank uh, the Department of Geological Sciences, uh, IFAS, the Food and Agricultural Sciences, the Water Institute, the office, uh, the UF Office of the President for the pilot study, as well as additional support through our institute for the UF Vice President for Research. We thank individual school districts who have supported some of your participation in this project. And we have private donors who's also supported this project uh, or this, excuse me, this professional development. For example, Pat Patty Bloom in Fort Lauderdale sponsoring Broward County teachers. I'd like to thank our professional development leaders, uh, Brian Abramowitz and, St and Stephanie Killingsworth, and you will meet, if you already haven't um, uh, been in contact with Elise Cross, she will help you with the logistics in terms of stipend payment. And finally, and without you all, this would not have happened. So thank you to our scientists and teachers for your participation in this four day event. I'm very excited about this as I have been in the past to professional de developments and I'm, look for, I'm looking forward to seeing how this, this week unfolds in terms of your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. We really appreciate hearing that from you. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about logistics, some housekeeping stuff very quickly, and then turn it over to our first speaker. So to do so, some of you saw this last night, but for those of you that were unable to join us, I'm going to go through it a little bit quickly, but you do have access to these slides in the Google Drive, so you can go back and reference it at any time. So again, just very quickly, each of our days are going to start at 9 a.m. Please make sure you are here on time and ready to be engaged and um, focused on whatever is happening in that moment throughout that day. Each of our days are going to end at 3.15. You'll notice you are working in your lab group from 1 to 3. From 3 to 3.15, we're going to come all back at your group, uh, I'm sorry, as a whole cohort and discuss what did, what did we do during that 1 to 3 session. What was happening? What are you working towards? And things like that. Uh, each of our morning sessions include scientists' presentations, lab tours, lessons, explorations, field trips, and more. So we have a lot of really amazing, really exciting things going on. We're really excited for you to take part in it. As you know, in the afternoon, you are going to be collaborating with a scientist developing a lesson. That is the goal. By Thursday at 3 o'clock, you will have spent six hours total with your scientist two on Tuesday, two on Wednesday, two on Thursday. And during that time, you will be working towards developing a lesson that could be implemented in your classroom. And we'll touch on this just a little bit later as well. Um, and I mentioned that daily debrief from three to 3.15 every day. So our goals today, we wanna to make you feel comfortable learning new content. We wanna make you a little bit of a, a expert on Florida's water and what is happening in the water and how it can be better integrated into your classroom. Like I said, we wanna help you gain new content knowledge as it relates to water in general, as well as Florida's water. We wanna bring you in as part of our network. As Bruce said, we have over a thousand teachers as part of our CEFS network. Um, now you are part of that community. You could reach out to any of us whenever you have a question with content, pedagogy or anything else classroom related, we are happy to help. If you need any help developing a lesson, that's what we are here for. Stephanie and I are both former teachers, as you know. We are happy to help in whatever way we can as it makes sense to do so. Um, and just tell you how to stay involved in the program. So I believe this is the last one as far as I'm gonna go over. And these are a few of sort of our expectations, our webinar agreement. As part of this workshop, we are really hoping you participate in a few things in a few ways. 
So what we are expecting of you is that you are on time, um, that you are, you're here, you're engaged. We chose you out of more than 280 teacher applicants. So by doing so, you are demonstrating that you are excited to be here, you're enthusiastic to be here, and we want to see that. We want to hear that. So whether it's in the chat, tell us what you are reacting to in terms of a speaker's presentation, classroom connections, anything that is popping into your head, those sparks and ideas going off as you hear these amazing presenters talking to you. Tell us all about that. You are a, a part of a group of really enthusiastic teachers that are able to join us and we're so excited to have you. And we wanna hear all about those ideas going on in your head. One thing that is, is important to us is we ask that you do keep your camera on. Of course, if you need to go to the restroom, if you need to take a break and stretch, that's fine. But we ask that your camera isn't off for an extended period of time. If you need to reach out to Stephanie or myself for any reason to do so, that's fine, we understand. But in this case, we ask that you please do keep your camera on throughout the workshop to demonstrate that you are successfully participating and engaged throughout our workshop. Uh, besides that, we ask, feel free to ask any questions, put them in the chat as our workshop is going on, whether privately to Stephanie or myself, or public so everybody could see. Uh, again, let us know if you need any help. As part of the stipend agreement, you are participating in all aspects of the workshop. You are going to complete the lesson or activity you develop with your scientist. And lastly, you are going to complete a scientist visit in the upcoming school year. So that's it from me. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to Stephanie or myself. Um, Besides that, we are going to move on to our first presenter today. And our first presenter we are really excited to have um, joining us today is going to be a Florida Sea Grant agent. We are going to have uh, Anna Zingranix present to us a little bit about the work that she does and its importance. So Anna, I believe you are already a co-host and you should be able to share your screen and go right ahead and get started when you're ready. All right. Thank you, Brian. Is, is my slide looking, is it there and B, does it look normal? Looks perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. That was a great introduction by Brian. And I wanna thank Brian and Stephanie for having me. As Brian mentioned, my name is Anna Sangronis and I'm the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent based in Miami-Dade County. And I work with the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service Miami-Dade County and Florida Sea Grant. So that's a lot of moving parts. And I'll just give you, I'll give you a brief explanation of what my job is and what the work I do. Let's get this bad boy. Here we go. If you are, if you all of you aren't familiar, the University of Florida is the center or the mothership, as I like to say, for the state of Florida's land grant university system, the cooperative extension system for our state. And what that means is that they oversee 67 counties. There's a cooperative extension program in every one of our counties in Florida that serves to extend, hence the, my title is extension agent, but extend the science happening at University of Florida, as well as other academic institutions, to the stakeholder groups or the end users that need it. Historically, this was very heavily focused on horticulture and agriculture, but now also has other components, including 4-H, community development, sustainability, and then marine science, which is where I come in with Florida Sea Grant. And if you look at the map that's on your screen, you'll see that here in the orange, if you're able to see my mouse, there's UF Gainesville, which is our center for both UF IFAS Extension and Florida Sea Grant. And the green counties illuminated on the map reflect where we have county-based Sea Grant Extension faculty. And it is our job to deliver extension programming that is user-specific, audience-specific, and reflects the particular needs and challenges of our respective counties. And I think it was Bruce who was saying earlier in his introduction that in addition to 
not only taking in that information, but what happens after that, that's part of my job as well, is not just delivering this information and teaching people about the ocean, about the challenges that it is faced by our different stakeholder groups, but also seeing, taking it one step further, what is it that they do with that information? So we're looking for what they've learned, any sort of behavior change that comes from it. And then of course, other cascades, if you will, in terms of environmental improvements, socioeconomic improvements, et cetera. And so I'm gonna keep an eye on my time. I got my clock right in front of me. So I'm here today to tell you a little about a pretty big project that I've been working on for the last two years. And that has to do with an outbreak of stony coral tissue loss disease, which has been happening throughout our entire Florida reef track system, and now has also spread to about a dozen other nations and territories throughout the greater Caribbean. And if you direct your attention to the map, you'll see that in just off of 20, 2014, off of Miami-Dade County, this coral disease was spotted and it traveled the 100 miles north through the northern extent of the reef track and has also traveled southwest through the rest of the reef track. And unfortunately, this map <laughs> needs to be updated because not only has the disease progressed throughout the Marquesas, it has now officially reached Dry Tortugas National Park. Mm. So I'll tell you a, a little bit about what that means exactly. So this coral disease has been particularly pervasive, number one, because it's been ongoing now for close to seven years. And it affects almost half of our reef building stony coral species that we have here in the tropical Western Atlantic and the Caribbean. And these are the most common species that are affected by the disease. And when I say affected, that is meaning that these corals usually suffer from complete mortality or death. And this can happen in a period of as little as months to even weeks. This disease event has also persisted throughout the winter months, which is typically when corals tend to have a little bit of a breather from stressors, namely warm water induced stress. So this has continued pretty severely all year round through more than 20 species of these reef building corals. And so there's a, it's been pretty devastating for our reef track and now of course in larger areas as well. Visually, if, if you're not familiar, this is what, these are a couple of examples of what this looks like if you're in the water. And, you know, these time series on top here, this is an Endangered Species Act listed pillar coral that went from perfectly healthy in May of 2014 to about a year later, once it became affected, was about 50% infected, which is indicated by this white area in the right half of the photo. And then a year later is completely dead and the corals, which are living organisms, simply can't survive it. And so this disease event has resulted in the functional extinction of the pillar coral in the northern one third of the reef tract. And that, that figure is pretty, pretty close to similar to the rest of the reef tract as well. So in late 2018, my colleague and I, the Monroe County Sea Grant Extension Agent, were approached by higher level management within the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And they said, this is still going. We need a way to engage the dive community. We really need the dive community to be involved. So we said, of course, you know, this is, this is why Florida Sea Grant is here. And this is exactly what you, University of Florida IFAS Extension does. And we joined a larger team and determined what it was that we wanted to accomplish with this training program. And the first was to increase the level of understanding and awareness of the disease event, as well as all of the different beneficial aspects of Florida's coral reef. And then get these folks in the water. Something that was particularly alarming was that this disease event was happening under the dive community's noses and 
a, the great majority of them really didn't know what they were looking at. They didn't really understand that they were seeing the reef system suffer and ultimately perish. So we wanted to have people in the water surveying to increase this underwater surveillance network because if, if you're not sure, and it, it's a little hard to tell from that map you saw a moment ago, we have over 300 miles of reef that spans five counties in Florida. So 300 miles is about the driving distance from Miami to Jacksonville. So it's pretty challenging to keep up with monitoring activities when you have that much, that much geographic area to cover. In addition to the classroom-based training, we developed an in-water training, which we offered when we had the opportunity to partner with certain organizations and dive shops. And that allowed the divers to get in the water and put that practical knowledge, put that knowledge to practical application. So not just looking at photos and practicing coral identification and characterizing coral condition, but also going in the water and seeing it in real time and then having a trainer right there next to them, myself or a colleague to say, yes, this is this or no, it's not. And we found that that in-water training was the most beneficial aspect to the entire program. To this day, we've had more than 20 training events throughout the reef tract and we have more than 230 divers who have participated. We've received 54 reports of either disease or no disease, which is great. We try to emphasize that reports of no disease are just as important as reports that show disease because we're also trying to determine how the reefs are recovering in the areas where the disease outbreak has already passed. Through pre and post tests and self-reflective evaluations, we've calculated about a, almost a 40% average gain of knowledge. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so through all of this, we've been able to pull a few very strong outcomes. The first is that we were successful in meeting our objectives that if nothing else, every single participant has walked away, having improved and increased their understanding, not just of the geographic extent of the Florida reef track, but also the different economic benefits that it provides, as well as the different ecological benefits that we reap the benefit from, particularly here in Southeast Florida, namely that protection from hurricanes with wave attenuation and flood control. And also, what was I saying? Ecological habitat for fisheries and just an incredible resource that is right off our shores. And particularly as you go further north throughout the reef track, you can access the inner reef from shore, which is pretty important. A lot of these individuals are becoming more engaged in local civic activities and performing other sorts of community volunteer efforts. They're also going on and taking other trainings. They are continuing with their coral identification and disease identification skills. And now we have provided a lot of training materials to the Turks and Caicos Refund as well as Puerto Rico Sea Grant and have done trainings for two different audiences in Puerto Rico, the recreational dive community, and then a separate training that we develop for managers and contractors and biologists to start understanding and knowing what to look for when they survey. And I included these photos on the right. I actually just received them last night from an owner of an eco-tour company in Vieques, Puerto Rico, which is a smaller island off the main island. And this young lady has been extremely actively engaged since her participation in the disease training we did there about a year and a half ago. So now not only is she continuing to survey and photo document the changes in the reef, she has also assisted with intervention treatments on some of the corals. So it's, it's pretty exciting to continue that relationship with her. And I think I'm right at the end of my time. So I wanna make sure we keep on schedule. It sounds like you all have a packed agenda. So if we don't have time for questions now, I would love to speak with you, give you more information. Please stay in touch with me and I'll ask Stephanie or Brian to put my email address in the chat. But Thanks, I wish Anna. you all a great day.
And we'll, we will do that. If you are able to stay for another 20 minutes or so, we do have a question and uh, answer session. If not, we will definitely be putting your email in the chat box, your preference. No, I'm happy to stay, no problem. Thank you. Okay, wonderful, thank you. All right, uh, so we are going to go ahead and move to our next presenter. Uh, we have with us today, Dr. Diavi, uh, this last name is hard for me, uh, Katia Pankiani. He is an assistant professor from University of Florida's Citrus Research and Education Center. This is yet another division of IFIS Extension, and he's going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the Citrus Rec is located in Lake Alfred, Florida. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn things over to you, Dr. K. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Stephanie, for your kind introduction. I will uh, talk about water systems for sustainability, uh, for sustaining environmental sustainability. Uh, it's a, a talk that will, uh, let me kind of start sharing, uh, talk about what I'll talk about. I'll uh, talk a little bit about what I'm doing uh, related to water and also nutrients, particularly if it rises. And then also I will talk about the importance of why we study water and also the various forms of water, and then touch a little bit of the water cycle because that's where we start talking about the impacts of water on the environment. And then touch a little bit about nutrient cycling. I'll, I'll pick nitrogen, but some of similar processes also occur in other nutrients like phosphorus, potassium, but nitrogen is the major one because that is the main driver for most of the Troubles we see in the oceans and the seas and also in the other water systems. Then I'll talk about some of the things that anthropogenic activities, human induced activities, cause on the environment and why it's important for us to understand the science. Then I'll just wrap up with the summary. So here we go. Uh, so my work uh, at the Citrus Research and Education Center is uh, related to looking at soil and water management and conservation because we know that. Soil is the hub of the fertilizers and also water, that's where we get all the nutrients for plants to use. And then I also work on nutrient management, trying to optimize fertilizer use efficiency. And then also look at irrigation and drainage management, where we look at water supply to plants and how it can be used to clear the environment. And then we also talk about water and nutrient based management practices, where we try to talk about the best practices or the optimal uses of water and nutrients other than wastage and other than environmental contamination, but we try to make sure that we are using the right amounts in the right proportions for bettering plant production. And then another fancy part that I work on is soil and crop modeling, where we try to use computer experiments and don't do any field experiments, but focus on computer experiments and try to mimic what we start in the field on the computer and see if we can predict long-term changes in the environment over 20, 30, or 100 years ahead. So the major theme of my work is to try to look at what we call the soil and water balance, where we look at water inputs through irrigation and rainfall to the soil. And then we talk about, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, we talk about water inputs also from the soil up to the root zone through capillary rise, and then water movement from the root zone to below ground, through what we call deep percolation, and then other inputs of water through subsurface flow into the zone or other outputs through subsurface flow. And then losses of water on the soil through evaporation and also through runoff, and also through use of the water by plants through transpiration. In summary, this is what you can see on the right, how we talk about those components of the soil water balance. This is the major schematic of what I work on. And then on the sort of balance, we try to even look at uh, aspects of um, the contents of water. So you try to express all that in a mathematical expression through what we call evapotranspiration. So a combination of evaporation and transpiration. And you take that as a group of either irrigation, the I in the equation on the left, if you can see, and the precipitation through all the rainfall and all the ice, all the hail, run off through all those losses of water on the ground surface, deep percolation, what I talked about, where water moves below the root zone, CR or capillary rise, where water moves into the root zone, 
and changes in subsurface flow or changes in soil water content that we, you, you see in the soil. And then we use sensors to track the water content in the soil, as you can see on the chart on the left. And on the right, you can see a little schematic that shows a box of water at saturation. That's it, like when the box is full. And then at um, field capacity, when it's just at the optimal content of water, and threshold water content when it's at the point where you want to get a reading point. Uh, I don't know if you can, my case is not really good. Yeah, well, reading point where you have water that has uh, gone below the amount the plant can take up. So the plant is wilting and struggling. That's the point. So there are so many tools we use to measure, for example, so water content and to decide when to get. So these are some of the tools we use. We use what we call so much as sensors tensiometers, granular matrix, capacitor sensors, uh, TDT sensors, TDR sensors. So there are multiple sensors that we use. And just below here, there's a little chart. And I, I think uh, Ms. Stephan has shared with you uh, some of my slides, or we'll share a little with you some of my slides. So these are some of the uh, benefits or disadvantages of each of the system. But for our Florida conditions, we prefer using the bottom three. So capacitance probes, and TDT sensors and TDR sensors. So they, they are good for most of our sandy soils in the state. And also we try to irrigate crops using other tools, including what we call smartphone apps. So those can be used in citrus, in blueberries, in avocado, in blueberries, in vegetables, strawberries, and other crops. And these are commercially available, so you can see on the links below. Uh, so you can access these and use them to irrigate. You need to have some tools what that we call uh, micro, uh, micro sprinkler irrigation controllers. And this is an example of why we try to use this. And for example, in citrus, we, we, we put a spray dry meter of micro sprinklers. We, we put information about micro sprinkler irrigation rates. We put the information about the spray pattern of the sprinkler and the type of selling you're dealing with. So on this website, which is called Flooded Automated Weather Network, we have this information for uh, citrus, of this information for vegetables, of this information for blueberries, and other crops like avocado. And we use this to make sure growers don't overuse water. In my work, I routinely use very uh, good equipment that are automated. You know, you don't want to be busy switching on bar and sometimes you mess up. So we have uh, tools, which you call data loggers, and we have solar panels. As you can see on the left, the blue tabs, those are wing like signals that help us understand water storage and how much water is used by plants. So we weigh that with uh, automated scales that give us information about how much water is used by the plants. But we make sure you have a weather station to tell you how much humidity, temperature, uh, rainfall, or how much wind is going on in the, in the setup. And then as you can see also on the, on the uh, left part here, I don't know if you can see, uh, uh, where of my cursor, we, you have the data lo loggers that can record in little time the information that you are recording either on the uh, weighing similars or the tabs. And also you have similar setup here on the, in the middle where you can show, um, uh, where you can, you, you can show the changes in uh, what are used in the, in the plant. So you put sensors on the tree, as you can see on the right here, where you can evaluate that and try to see how much water is used by plants. So in other cases, we have also been evaluating water conservation through use of what we call a flat match, where you put plastic on the soil surface, then you plant a tree on top to minimize evaporation losses. I'll talk further about evaporation when we talk about the water cycle. But we noticed that water evaporation is the major driver for water loss on the soil surface. So we try to put reflective mulch that prevents uh, water loss from the soil. And as you can see me in the action, we are putting a probe that measures water content, measures temperature, soil temperature, and also measures soil salinity to better understand what happens in the soil and how much water is used and how much water would be lost uh, on the soil surface. And then also the salinity tells us, for example, if you're applying fertilizer via irrigation water, we wanna know which irrigation system is triggering more movement of fertilizer beyond the horizon. That's very important for commercial citrus growers and commercial crop growers. The other thing that I work on is the uh, use of uh, 
optimal fertilization. So I'm just showing this slide, but there's so much information that we generate from this. But I would like to share with you this theme that covers most of my work on nutrient management. There was a professor in Germany uh, who talked about the law of the minimum, that whenever you are dealing with a plant, there will be several factors governing the plant's growth. And what will happen is that there are all these factors like light, temperature, water, and fertilizers or nutrients. But the scarcest resource is the one that will limit the plant growth. And therefore, we refer to that factor as a limiting factor. So as you can see my schematic, you have the soil conditions. As you can, I don't know if you can see here, so and other growing factors, so those are the nutrients. Then you have water, water just for the synthesis, how the plants make food, and then light. Light is one of the factors that now enables the plant to convert water into carbohydrates, into the food. And then you have all those nutrients in there. I don't know if my curse is going, I can't see. okay, there we go. Uh, you can see uh, the, the nutrients now are part of the, that barrel. So copper, zinc, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, nitrogen, boron, iron, molybdenum, sodium, mag uh, what's this one? manganese. All these nutrients are important for the tree to produce enough yield. If you have a limiting nutrient, one nutrient limiting nutrient, that will limit production. So that's very important. So this is where well, this is the simplest explanation I can give to understand what happens in the production cycle of a plant. Now, why should we talk about water? That's now, I think, what brought me to this discussion. So with all my work, I think I understand a little bit about water, that, OK, we know water supports plant growth because that's how plants make food through photosynthesis. We also know that, OK, animals have a home. They, 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 they enjoy uh, being in the water. They can drink. They can also uh, uh, recreate themselves. As you can see, the dolphin in Miami, a good time. And then we also know that uh, all the aquatic plants or, and animals also live in the, in the water and that we use water to clean our neighborhood. More importantly, we can all go to the beach. We can all swim. We can all go skiing, even in the snow just because we have water. If we didn't have water, we can't be skiing on the rocks, we'll be falling. And we know that that's, uh, water cleans up the neighborhood, filters all the lawns, filters all the environment. So that's why we have water and you have the birds there that can also have food in the water. Now this takes us to the most important topic of water cycle. So what are the major components? We know that okay, the major components of the water cycle that influence how we use water include transpiration. So this portion here on my left, where plants use water and precipitation, where you get water through hail, snow, and other forms. Evaporation, where water changes form from the ocean surface or the uh, border of water or the lakes or soil surface into the, uh, the sky. And then you talk about percolation, where water moves from the soil surface into the ground and then also the various forms of water that are below ground. So I try to define that, okay, with regard to the water cycle, there are specific terms that we need to bear in mind and keep whenever we talk about this, like through condensation, where water changes from the liquid form of water to the, uh, I mean, the gaseous form of water to uh, liquid form. And then the changes that occur from, on, in evaporation from uh, liquid water into water vapor, and then transpiration when the water changes from uh, its forms of liquid to, to I mean, I mean transpiration is changes from uh, the, the moving, living in the plant into the atmosphere uh, where it gets now changed in, through other processes. And then precipitation where you have water falling from, from the sky in the form of drizzling or rain, sleet, snow, or ice pellets, clopper and hell. I would like to emphasize that for my work, there's a component that I pick from the water cycle, like evaporation. I think I talked about transpiration also. When we talk about, we, we combine the two terms, evaporation, so the loss of water from the soil surface and the ocean surface, and then we combine that transpiration, the loss of water from the pump to form one term that we call evapotranspiration. So this is very important to me and so dear to my profession. And then in terms of percolation, we want to talk about how water now goes into the soil, 
that's very important because that's how the water gets into the soil, reaches the groundwater, and then that's. <laughs> and then, in terms of the nutrient cycles, I would like to just pick nitrogen here. We see that with nitrogen, there are so many processes that occur. For example, you see nitrogen changing from the sky and being fixed in the soil. So like getting back to the soil to help plant grow. That's uh, through lightning. I don't know if you can see it on the, on, the, on the right here, when rain falls. And then there's sometimes nitrogen comes from plant residues right here and into the organic matter and then goes into the soil. And then there are times when fertilizer goes into the root zone through what we call ammonia fertilization, like fertilizers that are called ammonia. And now we have forms where nitrogen is taken up by plants uh, through the roots, and then they use that to supplement crop growth. And then I would also like to emphasize that we have also nitrogen that goes into the soil through leguminous plants that fix nitrogen. They have special nodules or special parts in the roots that change nitrogen from the sky into nitrogen that can be used by plants. But there's so much information that goes in the soil. So much that I think we'll take the whole day to talk about that, but I don't want that. We, we have to be here for 10 minutes for my portion, so I can't go further than this. But I'd like to emphasize that we have forms of nitrogen, we have forms that can change from one form to the other. Some forms that are usable by plants, some forms that are usable by other animals, some are usable by other microorganisms. And we also have several factors that govern, govern those processes. But it's very important to understand that nitrogen is the major, major nutrient in the soil. And the other processes for all other nutrients, but I, I provided nitrogen as just our typical example. So this is the schematic that I'd like to be biased a little bit to talk about how citrus uses the nitrogen to, to, to move on. So as you can see now, this is a real time kind of example where nitrogen gets taken up by the plant. It goes into the tree and goes into the leaves. It goes into the roots. It goes into the trunk. It goes into the fruit itself, the juice that we enjoy in, the, 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 in Publix and, 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 and Walmart. And then the fruit that we enjoy, the Valencia and the Hamlin oranges, and the, the tangerines, all that comes from all this impact of nitrogen. And then you look in the soil, all the processes that go into the uh, nitrogen cycle. Uh, we, call about, we talk about decomposition when microbes convert nitrogen into uh, other uh, organic sources. And then those organic sources convert into the available nitrogen that can be used by plants in a process called mineralization. And then the, all the other processes that go on if you have excessive rain, for example, whereby the fertilizer goes beyond the root zone through leaching. That's one of my jobs to make sure that when you put fertilizer, we don't end up having a lot of nutrient leaching. That's why you can see this cycle is kind of uh, more or less a, a little time example other than the previous one, which is a little bit more theoretical. But this is a typical example of how we should manage nitrogen and other fertilizers. So in summary, for the nitrogen cycle, we worry about, okay, how much nitrogen goes into the plant? How much is lost through what we call volatilization? Changes of nitrogen from various forms to gaseous forms. And so we talk about, you know, climate uh, change gases, greenhouse gases, those are some of the nitrogen gases that we see. And then how much will be fixed? How much will be retained by organic matter or soil clay or microorganisms? And how much will be lost when you are very, saturated soil conditions, when you have less oxygen in the soil, less air, when we lose nitrogen gas through denitrification. And then how much do we lose the water table? Well, that's a story that we always make sure that our Florida Department of Environmental Protection is happy with us, whereby we document these figures to make sure we limit loss of uh, nutrients through uh, leaching. And then how much is removed by runoff? And this is now a component where we use simulation models because it's not easy to measure this. You can't be measuring nitrogen loss uh, when there's um, lightning. You, you cannot do that. So we use models when we know how much rain fell, we know our soil conditions, we know our water conditions, then we can predict how much uh, nutrients, well, how much nutrients of fertilizer was lost through uh, runoff. So in terms of some anthropogenic causes, of environmental degradation. I would like to just talk a little bit about what we see. So you see a lot of deforestation going on. We see a lot of desertification going on because um, people are cutting down trees. The trees support the soil 
they reduce the impact of rains, and then we don't have much erosion going on. But when you cut down the trees, you see that that's what happens. We lose most of the carbon storage. We lose a lot of uh, surface ground cover that protects the soil, and then we don't have much carbon, what you call carbon sequestration, or a lot of carbon retention in the soil. In terms of desertification, you see that uh, as we use water sources, as we uh, keep on uh, uh, cutting down trees, we start generating uh, a lot of uh, denser kind of conditions. Uh, this figure, I, I took it from, it's from West Africa, where it's, this is so rampant, it's so bad. You, you go to portions where when you want to dig and find groundwater, you can, you can dig for about 100 feet without finding water in the ground. And this is a very rural area. And then we also see that another uh, major driver right now is uh, urbanization, where we are seeing a lot of uh, changes. For example, for, with Florida in the early 1940s, the number, the population was about 2 million. Now moving to 1990, we moved to about 30 million. By 2000, we're close to 60 million. And now the predictions show that by 2050, we're gonna be around 32 million. So the numbers keep increasing. This will put pressure on freshwater sources for drinking, for recreation. So many people on the beach are crowding out, and then also so much water for own care and uh, 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 growing tough grass, and then also for livestock needs. Yeah, so uh, that's another driver uh, for competition for water. And then we also know that we do have other factors through erosion where when we use, we, we, we mess our water ways, so water has to find a way of getting out. And then that affects uh, the soil around us. So we, we have a lot of uh, erosion going on. And then more importantly, through our agricultural practices, we see that we are polluting not only the water, but also the air around us. Uh, for example, where we, we grow sugarcane. You will see that we, when you process the sugarcane, that's what you see, a lot of uh, methane going to the, 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 or the or carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide going to that atmosphere. And on the right, you can see when you don't use our recycled uh, uh, trash, that's exactly what we get. That goes into the ocean and eventually the fish eat that and die. And then we worry about what happens on the beach. We can't go because all the fish are just on the lying on the, on the beach. So in summary, I think, I don't know if I've convinced you that, okay, look, we have water. <laughs> But this is very important for all life, plants, and also animals. Uh, and we need to use it well to maintain a safe environment. And we know that we have various forms of water, or the, the, the cycle that water goes through, and that it goes through these cycles, but on the condition that we are still maintaining adequate vegetation around us, we're maintaining good ocean and good soil surface. We are using water uh, very well. And then, uh, we also want to maintain a very good environment where we can prevent erosion and we can prevent pollution by using all our uh, recycled products or like plastic and all that, we put them to the right waste and trash areas, uh, avoid desertification, and then uh, all other forms that can result into human-induced environmental degradation. I don't want to mention fertilizers here because I think that always becomes a hot topic. But putting the right amounts of fertilizers in the, in the plants, we reduce the amounts that go into the oceans and then can result in algal blooms and other uh, red tides that can cause problems to our fish and other aquatic lives. So in summary, I think this is what I prepared for you. I, I, I'll be happy to take any questions. And I think the first slide I had had my information, my email, my Facebook page, I'm yet to get my Twitter account active, but my first, my first page is very active. My email and my phone are also available. Uh, thank you all. Thank you so much for a truly fascinating presentation. I really enjoyed learning about the work that you do, its impact, and, and seeing all our teachers create excellent classroom connections and share ideas with, with each other in the chat as it was happening. Um, as was said, we are going to transition into our Q&A session. Um, as part of this Q&A session, Teachers, you are more than welcome to write in the chat if you have a question you would like to be asked to either Anna or Davy. The other option you are welcome to do is you are welcome to raise your hand if you'd like to, if you're not as familiar with Zoom. If you just go down to the Zoom uh, toolbar on the bottom there, you will see reactions. And then you should be able to click raise hand. And that will notify Stephanie and myself that you have a question. 
and we'll be able to call you, call on you and let you know that you're welcome to unmute and ask either Anna or Davey a question. Um, so let's get started. Let's see, there were a, a bunch of great questions in the chat. Um, Stephanie, do you have one pulled up or I can find one myself? Just as an FYI, I tried to address some of the questions and put information there and I'm happy to follow up, but that way I figured it might be save more time for questions during this live session. Yeah, great, thank you for doing so. Um, so let's start with Shannon. She asks, when using the black tarps on citrus, does that help preventing runoff or are those just used for retention of water? Say the question one more time. Sure. When using the black tarps on citrus, does, the, does that help prevent runoff or are those just used for retention of water? Oh yeah, that's a good question. It, it does both purposes. Uh, so they prevent runoff and also uh, cartel uh, evaporation. So the, essentially there's no evaporation water loss, which is a big deal because we, we, we save close to about 40%, up to 40% of water through just using that plastic. But more importantly, we also use that to prevent what we call citrus silage. There's a pest that causes a disease called citrus greening. So that plastic also repairs that silage. So we also use it for pest uh, control. Hope that addresses the question. Thank you. Uh, Avera asks, where was the citrus grove study at? Where did that take place? Okay, so the one with the plastic is at the Citrus Research and Education Center. I have a block that's about two acres big uh, uh, at the, in Central Florida and Lake Alfred. So in case you have time, sometime maybe if the station permits, you can come by, we, we, we give people tours. We can take you around to see what we are doing. So I think that would be a better, better answer. This will be for today, but if you wanna come and see yourself visually, see the trees, see the fruit on the tree and all that, and you know, like probes and all those instruments that I'm talking about, you can actually see them work in real time. And it's showing the computer, I can show you on the, on the ground how they're installed. Uh, but we have them at Citrus Research and Education Center. Very cool, thank you. Uh, Jose, it looks like you have your hand up. Do you wanna unmute and ask a question? Yeah, um, kind of a personal question. I got my, my sprinklers, you know, I got my fruit trees in my, in my backyard and the sprinklers give off that, uh, that rust. Um, how much does that rust affect the uh, growth of the plant? I, I know I had a, 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 a mamma tree and um, it was get, getting hit a lot by that rust and it dried out on me. I don't know if that affected it, if it was something else, but how much does that affect the plants? And um, is that a problem? of the water level, you know, the, uh, the table of the water level, or how does that, you know, affect them? Yeah, so usually rust is associated with maybe some, I don't know how long you've used that uh, uh, sprinkler, but usually it's associated with maybe a longer term use, used for a long time, or sometimes the water quality. So I don't know if you have done, measured the, the pH of your water or the, uh, salt content through salinity evaluation of your water, that can also be a problem. So what we normally recommend is either rust is a bit of a problem because now you have ion forming inside the pipes. So eventually those rust will start clogging the pipe. And then what will happen is that you not be getting the water pressure or the amount of water you want to be going to the pipes. So I don't know if you have observed that, but what you eventually observe is that you see a lot of decline in water output at the micro sprinkler jet or the sprinkler level. So the plant might start wilting. Yeah, so what we normally recommend is replacing the whole, the whole system. Yeah, it's a bit pricey, but that's the only best solution. Or if you still have the um, sprinklers working fine, but you feel like it's the pipes that have the, uh, the uh, uh, rust, then you can replace those main pipes to make sure that you have fresh pipes that are, or new pipes that are open, uh, or I mean, they don't have any clogging as a result of rust. Yeah, but rust is a big problem. We see that also in citrus. But that's from the well, because the, the rust comes from the well, they're PVC pipes. The system is fairly new. It's the water that's coming down from the, from the water level. Is that the rust coming from the, from the 
table of the water or is that, you know, because it's not any, it's not metal pipes. That's what. Oh, oh I see. Now, now I get, so it's, it's not similar to what I'm talking about. Okay, in that case, maybe do you have a filter? Mm, not sure. No, I, I, I'm not, not the rust filter. Yeah, if you, a filter might solve that problem because it means you have a lot of salt in your water. I don't, are you in Miami or where are you located? In Miami Dade. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So you might have a lot of, uh, you might have a lot of what we call bicarbonates. So the, those raise the pH. And usually when you, that happens when you're getting that water pump, uh, it will have a lot of source in it. Yeah, so what we usually do, we get some kind of a filter system that gets, a, when you just pump, get the water via a filter system, it takes out all the source. And then the water proceeds to the plant without any problems. Then you may not have that uh, problem of the, uh, of rust. That's how we manage that. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Our next questions are gonna be for Anna. Um, we have a few that are asking about the disease, and I know you mentioned that may not necessarily be the case, but we have a few questions in the chat about um, does the disease that affects coral reef, is it viral, bacterial, fungal, is it a mutation? Um, also questions along the lines of does the species factor into the quickness of disease spread? Noticing the picture used show um, it seems to be spreading faster. So. Is that a correct statement? Yes, thanks. I, I saw those come in at the same time. So thanks for repeating them. I saw Joe's question. And right now, to start with, the, the, the study of coral disease is a relatively new field. And even though coral diseases are naturally occurring, not a lot is known about how they're spread. But in the case of stony coral tissue loss disease, there are now a group of scientists who are going and performing studies specifically to determine what you've asked. And to this point, it's been found that at least one pathogen is bacterial. And that ties in directly with a question I saw earlier about treatments. And some treatments have been developed and they, have, they started out with a chlorinated epoxy being applied directly to the coral with the use of a trench or fire break to try and help not only track if it's working or not, but also give, try to stop the disease from jumping that barrier. And it was found that the chlorinated epoxy wasn't working so well. And now there has been a coral disease specific antibacterial, uh, what's it word, amoxicillin amoxicillin type of treatment that are being applied to try and halt the progression of the disease on the corals. So it's, it's said with pretty good confidence that at least one pathogen is bacterial. And Laura's question with respect to the pictures is that yes, in when we think about the 20 or so refilling species that are affected by this disease, they're categorized into three groups. Those that are highly susceptible, intermediately susceptible and low susceptible, or lowly doesn't really make sense grammatically, but have little or unknown susceptibility. And those species that fall into that highly susceptible group, that's seven or eight, and those include the two you saw at the end of my presentation, well, and the beginning of the presentation for that matter. And usually those, those species are, if they become infected, they usually succumb or suffer mortality very rapidly. And they're also good indicators of when the disease boundary starts being uh, noticed or discovered in a new area because those species tend to show signs of disease first. So perfect question and to answer, yes, they, they do, those more highly susceptible species do show signs more quickly and do suffer mortality. Anna, we do have a follow-up question, and then I'm going to turn things over back to Davy. Our question is, do scientists or experts think that the infections can be linked to the active ingredients in things like sunscreen and bug spray? At this point, that's extremely hard to, to link. My instinct is no, but rather likely, we use this term a lot, the death by a thousand cuts analogy where it's the culmination of a lot of things happening. 
obviously the pathogen is the number one smoking gun, if you will, but warmer water, their stressors, everything, all those other conditions, uh, water quality that has, it's not quality, <laughs> that it's going down in quality, all of these things make the corals a lot more susceptible to any stressor, disease included. But bug spray and sunblock, not with, not when it comes to this disease outbreak. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Chelsea who asks, um, what incentives or buy-in do farmers have to promote and use these modifications in their crops? Is that mine, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right, okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, we do have some incentives for growers. We, we call those, uh, the, 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 uh, we, we call them cost share incentives. So uh, the water management districts across the state, so Southwest Florida where I belong, and then there's um, uh, St. John's River, then the South Florida Water Man Management District, there's Swan River Water Management District. I think there are about six or seven of those. They give growers what we call cost share incentives. For example, if a grower owns a weather station, then they use that weather station to schedule irrigation. So they use the data from the weather station to be able to decide when to irrigate. For them to own a weather station, when the weather station costs about, say for example, $10,000, the water management districts pay a portion of that. So the grower will pay a portion, but the water management district also pay, uh, pays a portion of it for the grower to own that weather station. And then there are also cases where growers are asked to reduce water input in their production. So the growers record how much water they're applying to the, to the crop. If they reduce their water input by some amount, they get, I don't know, is it rebates or something from the water management just at the end of the year, they get some waivers uh, in terms of costs of either fertilizer or electricity or water itself. The, the bill is reduced drastically. So they get some incentives. Yeah, so they can't just do that for nothing. They get some incentives and then they, 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 are, they are rewarded uh, for that. And in terms of replanting, for example, there's another aspect where the growers have been planting new trees in areas where we have had loss of devastating effects of citrus grading, a, a disease that causes a lot of damage to citrus trees. The growers also get incentives. They, they, they get trees for free and then they plant those in their growth. So we have been having a lot of the planting going on. So there are lots of incentives going on. Thank you. Any other questions? We have a few more minutes as long as we have our experts here. Feel free to ask them any questions that come to mind. May I raise my hand real quick? Absolutely, go ahead. I wanted to just follow up as to what Evie was saying. And I, I mentioned it in the chat, but in case anyone, if you hadn't gotten a chance to see it, when someone asked, how do the growers learn about this or what's their incentive? That my main office, which is located out in the Redlands in Miami, the section of Homestead, that's the agricultural community. There are agriculture and horticulture agents whose job it is specifically to work with these growers. And so not only do they, well, now we're getting back to this, but invite the growers in for classes and trainings. They also do site visits and consultations in which they're bringing this information to the growers. So it's, it's pretty active and they're taking information from researchers like Davey and other fruit and vegetable and soil specialists to the growers so that to directly benefit them as well as people end up buying and consuming these products. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Amy, I saw you put a question in the chat. Do you wanna unmute and ask that? Hey, everybody. Um, so I know there's kind of a trend now looking at biodiversity and how kind of letting nature be a part of the solution. And, you know, with Florida's water table going really low and salt intrusion, I'm wondering if, um, Davey, if there's any thought or research or people that are looking at, I know it's such a big industry, maybe it's not possible, but I think in California and there's movies like little biggest little farm where they're letting nature be a part of the solution instead of it just being let's manage how much water but letting you know growing natural plants that actually will help the water come down i just wondered if there's any research or 
management programs that are working on that. And oh yeah, that's very true. Uh, I've had, uh, I'm, I'm not the one working on that, but I've had a uh, few colleagues working on that. Uh, some colleagues are working on use of uh, cover crops, so crops that can manage or, you know, or control pests, but also uh, bring up nutrients. So you don't have to put any fertilizer. They, they, they cover crops, fix nitrogen, uh, bring phosphorus and other nutrients back up into the root zone. And then they increase the soil organic matter or the dead matter that helps uh, increase uh, retention of water and nutrients. There's that effort. So it's happening mostly in Southwest Florida and a bit of the central Florida reach that's there. And then there's another aspect uh, where people are using uh, uh, integrated pest management where they're not spraying any, any uh, chemicals, no antibiotics or any, any pesticides, just trying to let all natural organisms control whatever is happening. Then there are those, as you mentioned, that are also trying to work on just letting, uh, uh, not bring all these other additional drainage structures and all that, but, uh, but that effort is uh, mostly along the, uh, it's a bit in, in Fort Pierce, uh, where they call it work on similar aspects. Yeah, so there are some efforts going on that are trying to use natural systems, because I think most of everybody agrees now that we have overworked the soil, we have overworked the trees with uh, uh, insecticide, pesticide, and fertilizer inputs, and all that, but we don't seem to get to anywhere. Uh, we are just, you know, trying to add stuff into the system. Yeah, so everybody's trying to use a very natural, organic kind of uh, system that doesn't have all these other human-induced or inorganic means of restoring better performance. So they're letting biological diversity carry its course. Yeah, so we have elements of that. Not, not all of it, but elements of that are being researched upon. The other part that is also being researched upon is where they're using shedding, where they put some kind of shed to look at whether reduced light penetration can make sure trees are using up more nutrients and water, but also at the same time, not providing the favorable environment for pests. So there's also that kind of research going on. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. You're welcome. All right, and we'll wrap up our Q&A session with one more question today. This one is gonna be from Carla who asks, um, can you please comment on the balance of carbon in soils decreasing and atmosphere carbon increasing? Is that mine? It could be either of you. It looks like Anna wants you to take that one. <laughs> okay, that's okay, I'll take it. Yeah, uh, so I think, I think the major, the major driver to that, I mean, it's, it's, it's as simple as saying that we are, we are getting a lot of, a lot of emissions from human induced activities. So for example, I mentioned sugarcane harvesting. Maybe I've, I've been happy to see this happen in uh, Everglades where we have these uh, harvesters that pick sugarcane raw. So they, they, they don't, burn, they just take the harvesters to pick the sugar again. That's a big innovation because I've, I've, seen, I've seen those systems here, I've seen some in Brazil and I've seen some in, in Africa. In Africa, they still burn. Uh, most of it, they burn in South Africa, they do a bit of harvesting by the machines, but there are parts of the Africa that they still burn. When you burn, you are adding to the atmospheric carbon. And it's not always a good kind of carbon. So you have carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and all the other forms. So the major drivers, I want to mention that we have so many activities going on uh, through either fossil fuels, through uh, burning. You can see escalation of uh, uh, wildfires in the, the fields. That also contributes to that. Uh, and then we have also seen a lot of uh, uh, the other practices by humans, industrialization, urbanization, uh, we are wasting a lot of uh, products that contributes to the, to the carbon. Now, the reduction in the uh, soil uh, or the soil carbon, usually it's because we are not maybe returning most of the plants back to the soil. We, we, we just maybe burn, so we are reducing the addition of carbon to the soil. And then if you also don't even add other organic sources like mulch and other uh, plant wastes, 
or organic waste to the soil, obviously we are not increasing. And the plant itself then utilizes that carbon in other forms through complexation or uh, through combination of fertilizers with the, the little carbon that was in the soil to form compounds that can be taken by the plant. So that also depletes the carbon that's in the soil. I don't know if that, that addresses your question. If I can just add on to what DB was saying, I know I deferred it to him, but I do have some I can I can add, and that's this idea. Well, it's not an idea; it's there's scientific data to prove it to back it up that both mangroves and seagrasses and other vegetation are extremely effective at sequestering carbon, and mangroves in particular, when we think of trees storing carbon, <clears throat> excuse me. The trees are usually storing carbon, terrestrial trees, in their leaves and in their branches and in the trunks. However, mangroves are extremely effective at sequestering carbon in their root systems. So when we lose mangroves, whether through natural disturbance or clearance for development, not only are we losing the tree and the other functions that it provides, but it is, we're losing the storing of that carbon and it is being, again, released back to the atmosphere. So it's, it's, I mean, I'm sure I don't have to, to preach to this group, but it is just another reason for why these marine ecosystems are so very important ecologically, not just for the aesthetic and the recreational and the tourist values, but these particular functions, which are incredibly, they're, they're only increasing in importance. Thank you, Anna, for chiming in on that. Well, y'all, this takes us right up to our break. And I wanted to thank both of our presenters for sharing information with us today. Um, it's really interesting to see these two perspectives, yet how they are intertwined. So again, thank you to um, both of you. And thank you for hanging out with us and uh, answering the questions from our uh, teachers today. If you didn't notice teachers, I've put both of their emails in the chat box, but no worries. Um, this information along with their presentations are housed in the folder. And we're going to do a little tour of that when we come back from break. Um, the recordings from today are also going to be up on YouTube a, a bit later today. So you'll have access to all this material should you wanna go back and review it or share it with your classrooms, et cetera. So at this time, I think Brian is sharing a, a slide. We're going to come back um, at 10.30. We'll resume our sessions and get into some more about the PD logistics next. Brian, is there anything that you wanna add on uh, to that before we go? Just, of course, feel free to turn off your camera when you go to the restroom. Uh, just turn it back on when you come back, and that'll be our indication that you're back, you're ready to go, and then we are good to get started for our next session. Um, and I also just want to personally thank Anna and Davey for their amazing presentations this morning and joining us and for all the work that they do. We appreciate it so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye.
session today is going to be a little bit of uh, more housekeeping, a little bit of logistics, background information from Steph, from Stephanie and myself. Um, just to fill you in on some bigger items before we jump into more of the bulk of the workshop itself. Um, I really enjoyed seeing your comments this morning. I'm really excited about hearing from the rest of our presenters, our speakers, our keynotes, our sparks, and hearing what other amazing ideas you all come up with. So to jump into it, give you a brief overview. I'm going to pull up the schedule right now, just so you could see a little bit of what this looks like. So we went over this just a little bit last night, a little bit this morning, and obviously you have a copy of this. That's how you all got here. But each morning is going to look very similar to what this morning did. We're going to hear from about two or three presenters each morning. Uh, two of them are going to be very similar to Anna, those 15 minute talks. And then we're going to move on to a keynote presentation, just like the amazing one that Davey gave us this morning. So that's going to happen each day of the workshop, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Just like today, after that, we'll have a Q&A session and then take a bathroom break. From there, we are going to hear where we are. This is a little bit of a varied thing right in the middle of the day itself. Today, we're going to go over some logistical items. We're going to hear from previous uh, participants from our workshops. We're going to hear from a lab itself, a scientist talking about how they use water in their lab and how what they do with that data and what their problems, water problems they're trying to solve. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to hear from three amazing organizations sharing their uh, water lessons and resources. We're going to put teachers and have you take on the role of students and participate in the activities. And then we'll rotate through so you get to see each of those organizations. Thursday, we have a lab tour that is going to be taking place, very similar to the overview. We'll walk around, see what's going on within their facility, what equipment they use, and things like that. We're also going to be taking a virtual field trip uh, led by the Kings of the Springs, who you may be familiar with. And if not, they're going to show us a really amazing video that they produced um, as part of their organizational tour. But the bulk of it, as you know, is going to be this collaboration between you as the teacher and the scientist itself. So during this time, this two hour window on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, that's when you and the scientist, as mentioned, are going to be developing, co-developing, I should say, co-developing a lesson plan to be implemented this school year. That's what we hope to achieve. By the end of three o'clock on Thursday, you will have had six hours to work with your scientists and your other colleagues within your lab group to develop something to be implemented in your classroom. It could be a lesson activity, it could be a lesson plan, could be several plans if you're ambitious, whatever you want to do. However, our expectations are that a lesson plan is going to be developed within this time frame through that collaboration. That lesson plan that was developed will be implemented at some point during the upcoming school year and there will be either a physical or virtual scientist visit from the scientists that you worked with visiting and it could be before your lesson could be after your lesson they could be written into the lesson saying how they do similar processes to whatever is going on within the lesson they could be introducing the lesson and maybe do a Zoom session before. They could show up to the classroom before. However you want to integrate it, as long as you, what you develop has those three components themselves. So again, they are really the collaboration, developing a lesson plan, and then I guess two or so. And then the implementation where the scientist visit takes place during the upcoming school year. So that's really what our schedule looks like throughout this time frame. And I saw there were some logistics questions in the chat earlier. Um, you don't have to worry about going anywhere else to work with your lab group. During the lunch break, I'm gonna be behind the scenes setting up breakout rooms. So each lab is going to be in their own breakout room. I'm gonna be setting that up when we come back from our lunch break. I'm gonna open up those breakout rooms and everyone is going to be sorted with their scientists. Um, if you have any questions about the schedule, logistics, anything like that, Feel free to write it in the chat or send Stephanie or myself an email and we'll get back to you as soon as we can to help answer that question. Besides that, I'm going to 
pull up a little bit more to share a little bit more background information with you about CEPHs. So just to get started, as you know, Bruce touched on this a little bit already. We were all started, our TESI, our Thompson Earth Systems Institute was started um, from John and Beverly Thompson, who were former UF alum. And as Bruce mentioned, I'll go through this a little bit quickly because Bruce said this already, but it is it does provide some important background context into what we do here. They felt the research carried out at the University of Florida is critical to our understanding of Earth systems. So that's why we focus on Earth systems. And very simply put, that is going to be air, water, land, and life. So it does cover almost everything, which is really nice. So that's exactly what we do here at the Thompson Earth Systems Institute. Us, as part of the Scientist in Every Florida School program, is just one of the core aspects of the Thompson Earth Systems Institute. So we are able to provide services to K-12, but additionally, beyond communicating and educating about earth systems within Florida and those air, water, land, and life factors that are taking place, we also serve other audiences as well. As you know, Scientists in Every Florida School Program is mostly K-12. Beyond that, we provide additional programming for uh, lifelong learners, scientists and science communicators, as well as policymakers. Uh, if you are in the Gainesville area, you may have seen that Thompson Earth Systems Institute has organized Science on Taps. Last year or the year before, we organized a series called Is Florida Trying to Kill Me? And that was all about leading uh, presentations on mosquitoes, wildfires, reptiles and gators, um, sinkholes, all of those kind of things going along with that theme there. So we brought scientists uh, as well as the community to local bars and led sessions about what is going on in Florida and should we be concerned about it. So that is just one of the many ways that we reach lifelong learners as well as we recently ran a campaign called the insect effect um, as well. And that, that goes very similar along the lines of the comments that were going on in the chat earlier. Why do we keep our, our grass in front of our lawn so beautiful and green? Does it have to be that way? It's ultimately hurting our insects. So we, we try to inform our Florida communities and not just our K-12, but exactly what's going on in many ways, including our newsletter as well. Scientists and science communicators, we're often leading sessions and this also goes along with our scientists in every Florida school program. When we send scientists to classrooms, whether it's physically or virtually, we have set up trainings and courses for them ahead of time. We are training them on communication so they know ahead of time exactly what CPOMS is, what a standard is, whether they grew up in Florida or not. They know exactly what teachers need to teach to and understand. So we're training them in that respect of how do you cut out that jargon when you speak to other audiences? Speaking to K-12 students is very different than speaking to scientists in your lab. So we offer those types of communication and learning opportunities for scientists as well, as well as regularly informing policymakers of what is going on within Florida's um, Earth's systems. So as Bruce mentioned, there was a call for moonshot. And as he said, there was a call for a bold, seemingly unattainable goal that benefits society. So Bruce submitted a proposal and it was ultimately funded. And that's what led us here today to this Scientist in Every Florida School program. He really emphasized how this is a huge initiative. And if we are able to do this within a decade, reach every public school, I should say when, when we are able to do this within a decade, reach every public Florida school, there will be impacts of those students seeing the real science, cutting edge research, seeing it beyond the classroom, beyond the textbook, making it feel real from having a scientist in the classroom and putting these faces to words, these science glossary keywords and making it, like I said, feel more authentic. So that's what we're doing. Within a decade, we envision that a UF scientists, faculty, students from the Scientist in Every Florida School Initiative will we'll visit and visit is in quotes because it may be physical, it may be virtual, every K-12 public school in every Florida district at least once a year. So our mission, as I said, we're really focusing on the cutting edge of the research by providing science role models, 
as well as experiences to inspire our next generation of environmental stewards. So uh, these experiences may be live streams. Um, the role models are taking on that role. Research has shown that oftentimes when students think about scientists, they're thinking about an old white man in a lab coat. So we want to continue to break that perception of scientists can look in all different ways. Um, and oftentimes we'll have teachers submit a scientist request and say, um, I would like a scientist to identify similarly to my students and provide that type of role model opportunity for them. So more of what we hope to do, this was mentioned briefly. We currently have well over a thousand teachers and scientists in our network. And there are, I believe the last number I checked was close to about 600 within our CEPS Facebook group. I would encourage you to join our Facebook group if you are active on Facebook. It could be an opportunity for you to, again, reach out for pedagogy questions. Uh, we've seen teachers comment on there and say things like, over the summer, my administration moved me from second grade to fifth grade. Does anybody have resources they would be willing to share with me? Or this is the first year I'm moving to a high school classroom. Are there resources that someone could help me with? Um, sometimes teachers will ask for content support, like I said, pedagogy support, or they're moving to a new area or school and ask for recommendations. There is this sense of community, almost the community of practice and, and this sort of larger cohort where you can reach out to. This is essentially your larger group of colleagues now. You can ask them any questions you would like. And there is that community there for you to join and be a part of. Even if it's as simple as just, I uh, am teaching this topic, here's my lesson plan. Does somebody mind looking it over and make sure it looks accurate in your eyes as well? So we try to do this in addition to providing role models, to providing teacher content knowledge support. Uh, Stephanie and I were both former teachers and we realized as teachers, you are asked to teach so much different content that at times it can be overwhelming. And it's especially hard to be an expert on every single one of those things. So that's why we provide these scientists to be able to support with that. Last month, a teacher from Marion County reached out to me and said, I taught these three topics this year, but I felt like I could have done a better job with it. And that's what I'm looking to do next year. Do you have a scientist that I can just Zoom with one-on-one -on -one and they can just share their expertise on the topic? So next year I can revamp those lessons and provide them sort of the scientific expertise they deserve. And I can feel more confident teaching them as the year goes on. So we also provide those types of opportunities. If you just want to check in with the scientists, the students don't necessarily have to be involved. We want to help support in any way we can, and that includes helping to increase your content knowledge as a science teacher. One of the other areas we, we want to support is beginning teachers. We realize it is really challenging to be a beginning teacher, especially in your first three years of teaching. There is a lot to take in, and it is really challenging. So that said, we want to be there for you. Feel free to reach out to us at any time or any of your teacher colleagues, Florida Public Schools. Feel free to share our email address and we can help any way that we can. Ultimately, we're hoping that this will increase student achievement. Our program is still sort of new. So we are starting to implement more of those quantitative and qualitative assessments, starting to see what does this look like with our program involved and what types of student achievement growth are we seeing as a result of scientists visiting these classrooms. So like I said, we are completely free. Most uh, what we offer is going to be free to you as a teacher, these scientist visits are free, um, as well as these PD opportunities are going to be free opportunities for you. Uh, we offer physical and virtual interactions with scientists in a variety of fields, as long as it relates to air, water, land, and life, as long as you can make that connection, which again, is almost a connection to anything. So if you can make that connection to air, water, land, and life, we are happy to be there to support you. So we provide teacher professional development opportunities. Typically, we provide about three of them per year. This is our biggest one. This is the one that we do that's a week long every single year. Besides that, they vary. For example, in 2019, we brought about 25 teachers to Montbrook, which is a paleontological dig site, uh, UF owned. 
And each teacher got a one meter by one meter square plot and they were given paleontology tools as well as paleontologists joined us out there for the dig through that day. And one of our fifth grade teachers from Escambia County actually found a 5 million year old fossil horse tooth, which was incredible. The news covered it in Escambia County, Pensacola was all over it in the news. And she was able to go back to her classroom and say, look kids, Beyond your teacher, I'm also a scientist. Look what I did over the weekend. Look at this fossil horse tooth that I found. How cool is that? And you should have seen the way those kids' eyes just bulge up. They were so impressed with that teacher and it was really incredible. So we do those types of opportunities as well as those things can be school district requested. If you feel like, for example, you may be a science department chair or lead your science department. If you feel like, one of your, for example, test scores, the students test scores were low in a specific area. And you just want to bring in a scientist to work with your teachers for a maybe a, a one hour thing and say, can you help us to increase our teacher content? Uh, like I said, knowledge on this topic. And then we could sort of reteach those misconceptions to help develop those uh, student knowledge a little bit deeper. That's a, that's something we are happy to do as well. Uh, one other opportunity that we really pride ourselves on is these collaborations and partnerships that we're developing between teachers and scientists. That's a really big thing, the ongoing partnership. We want you to feel like you have someone to reach out to at any time. If you have a question about content, again, feel free to reach out to Stephanie or myself. We'll connect you with someone to help have those questions answered for you. Uh, like you're doing this afternoon, the collaboration with teachers and scientists to design lessons, labs, activities, and projects. Obviously, that's a core component of our professional development workshop this week. However, it doesn't have to end this week. If you want to continue working with a scientist and develop more lessons and things like that, feel free to reach out to us and we'll help facilitate that, set that up. Uh, we run several live streams this year, uh, each year. We do an aquatic themed one in our partnership with the Anjari Foundation called Ocean Expert Exchange. We also do one uh, with Mounts Botanical Garden that are open to any teachers throughout the whole state. Um, and you will be able to see all that information right on our website, which I believe is in my virtual background, that Bailey link. Oops. Oh, so here's what the process looks like. Basically, on our website, or we'll share it out with you, of course, as well, you will see a scientist request form. That request form will ask you a bunch of information like, what is your name, email address, where do you teach, what school, what would you like out of a scientist visit? What is the number of students that may be reached as part of this? What topic, if you want to include the learning standard, that's great. If not, what topic would you want to happen during these times? Typically, our visits are about 30 minutes. That doesn't mean that they have to be that long or as little as that long. Um, typically, they are about 10 minutes of a scientist sort of explaining, I'm sorry, about 20 minutes of a scientist explaining about a little bit about who they are, their journey to becoming a scientist, why they wanted to be a scientist, essentially a shorter version of their journey to where they are today. And then they do uh, um, the, the requested scientist content that you requested that's personalized to specific to your request. And then there's a little five to 10 minutes or so opened up for student questions. However, that is flexible. There's no prescribed cookbook thing that we do as part of these. They are all uh, personalized to whatever you request as the teacher requesting this scientist visit. When Stephanie or, or myself or I get that request in, we will start looking for a scientist that really matches exactly what you're looking for. Let's we'll send out an email that is starting that communication to align your vision with the scientist's vision. And then you'll start to communicate. You'll start to email back and forth. As part of that, we ask that you include us so we could support you along that way. Uh, that email will continue to plan and then prepare for that visit. Visit will take place. And then we'll just follow up and say, how did it go? If you would like to do one next time, we'd be happy to do it with you. And how could we improve? Is there anything you would like to see differently? Just as feedback, because as an organization, we're always looking to grow. And as I said before, these are things that we're sharing with scientists. 
This is what CPOMs look like. We realize that as a Florida teacher, much of what you do has to be aligned to the state standards. So we are sharing tips and tricks, research supported um, uh, tips for communicating, as well as what CPOM says about the learning standard that you have to teach to. Of course, unless it's a role model type visit, which is a little bit different. So last year alone, just to share a little bit of data, um, last year we, ha um, we had over 1,700 completed visits um, that reached 379 Florida schools and 39 out of the 67 counties. And you can see a map to the right of exactly which counties we reached and the number of completed visits in each of those counties. So just to quickly go over again, as we wrap up my portion here, we offer physical visits and, and we run the gamut in terms of the type or topic of presentation in terms of our systems. Similarly, virtual presentations, whether it's a, a webinar and you say, I want this to reach a couple teachers in my school, or I want this just for my classroom, that's okay too. The virtual visits will extend that capacity as well. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have some amazing scientists doing our live streams on plants, on bees. This one was really incredible. We did this um, with the Orlando in the Orlando city, um, and they were sharing how they get youth involved in beekeeping um, as a alternative hobby for them to get them involved in science type things. And then where we are today with professional development opportunities, and I would encourage you to sign up for our newsletters or follow us on social media at UF Earth Systems, and that is the first place you will hear about all of our PD opportunities or other types of opportunities that we offer. And last, just to wrap up, as Stephanie said yesterday, um, we would love for you to tag us, and if you are the type of per teacher that uses social media. Um, like I said, you could use at UF Earth Systems, you could use hashtag CEFS, S-E-F-S, hashtag scientist in FL schools. These will all be linked to us. And we would just love to see what you take pictures of, what you do this week, anything you comment on. Those things are all really valuable to us. Um, yeah, just one more thing, as I said as well, Facebook, Twitter, we're on all the social media at Scientists in Every Florida School on our Facebook group or at UF Earth Systems. And I think with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Stephanie to talk a little bit about our website and where you can find resources there. Thanks, Brian. I'm gonna start screen share real quick again. And um, just real quickly, before I give you a grand tour of how to get involved and where to find or access a lot of the things that Brian mentioned, um, just going over PD objectives again, two that I think are important to touch. I want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable and in a safe space today and the rest of the week as we progress and work together as a team, because a big part of what we do, as Brian mentioned, is collaboration and building these teacher scientist networks, which we are so happy that you're a part of now. Um, I'm going to touch on this final bullet point here, understanding how to stay involved in, in, with CEFs and take advantage of all the variety of programming and resources that Brian mentioned. Um, so before we get dip into that too far, I know some folks are working off of different platforms or systems within their district, and we're using Google, which may or may not be what you're familiar with. So um, everybody should have received a, a CEFS PD folder, and this folder can be saved to a Google Drive if you've got a Gmail account or a school account through Google. And in that folder, you're going to find a series of tabs or folders that break things down and organize them for you. A big question from today was about presenters slides and materials and information. You'll find all of the presenters today uh, with their PowerPoints in here. And of course, all of their contact information is located within those slides. So I wanted just to bring that to your attention um, so that you are aware of where those things can be located. Again, you can save them to your drive. Um, another super important folder is the research labs folder. And if you've forgotten or you need a refresher, in that folder, you will find the document that breaks down each of the labs and whom uh, will be in those labs. This is the lab you're working with for the entire week. That was a question someone asked in the chat box a bit earlier. And I just wanted to emphasize that again to the whole group so that you're aware. Um, in that document, should we have any issues with storms, uh, with disconnect or anything that might happen with uh, technology, 
you've got everybody's email and everybody's phone number handy uh, within this document. So just be aware of where you can find that uh, within the research labs folder. Two other things that are part of the deliverables for the week is for the showcase on Friday, some sort of presentation or lesson plan. Another question asked in the chat box related to, can we see an example of some lessons that have been created through um, Ceph's PD? And the answer is yes. Right after I present to you now, uh, we will have some teachers that are gonna give a little testimonial. They're gonna share the amazing project that they worked on all last year. In fact, uh, one of those teachers is currently working with that same science group this summer to flesh out some more that I don't wanna go into too deeply because I'm sure that's gonna be part of the conversation. But you can make a copy by right clicking on uh, this particular PowerPoint slide and um, you just hit make a copy and it will create a new copy of which you'll see it pop up. You can then right click again and rename that copy, whatever your name or whatever your group's name, and then you can drag it into your folder for your lab. So I just wanted to share how to do that in case uh, you are unfamiliar. The lesson plan um, here, I'm gonna click on this. If you have some sort of uh, writable software, I use Kami, for example, that lets you write on PDFs or Adobe or whatever you might have, you can use that or we've made it easy by clicking on this hyperlink at the top. It will open up the writable fill-in version for you. Let me just click start filling and you can write your lesson plan this way. And then at the very bottom, it will allow you to save or preview that as a PDF and put that into your, your folder with your uh, lab groups information. So um, just a quick little tour of where to access those materials. Uh, you'll find that a number of these labs have already put some materials in there. Don't worry if your lab group doesn't have anything in the folder yet, that's what this week's all about. So this is a dumping ground for your group to put uh, things you've brainstormed, researched, found, written, created, et cetera, in that folder. Um, these folders are accessible to everyone. So even if you're an elementary teacher and you're in one group, but you're really enticed by something you hear from another group, you'll have access to everybody's materials to use in your classroom should you like. Um, so I just wanted to point those things out to you here. Uh, as far as the project that you're creating at the end or the product at the end, it can be solo or you can decide to work as a team or partner up. Um, that is going to be organic and happen within your groups and uh, it's something that you all will determine as a, a group as a whole. So that is the CEPHS folder. The other thing I wanted to do is a quick tour of the CEPHS website. And Brian has it on the back of his, um, his virtual background, but I've also put several important links in the chat box for you. That chat box will be saved um, as well as all of the recordings of the sessions each day, and they'll be uploaded onto our YouTube channel so that you have access to those materials. But in this website, a couple key points, Brian spent some time talking about requesting a scientist. The button right here front and center, when you click on that, will take you to the Google form. And this is what you'll fill out to inform us what you're looking for uh, for a scientist visit, be it virtual or physical. So that is the request to uh, a scientist tab. He mentioned a lot of the wonderful partners and programs that we offer live stream events for. And I'm just gonna run through one of our last sessions in May before the end of the school year there. This is the Ocean Expert Exchange Series with Anjuri Foundation he mentioned. And in this particular uh, event, we talked about lionfish and invasive species, particularly the lionfish, however. Each of these has extension, K-12 extension activities. And I wanted to show you what these look like so you can be aware of some of these wonderful things you can use as a pre or a post live stream um, lesson or, or connector to the units or lessons that you're discussing in class. Everything is broken down by uh, standards, elementary, middle, and high school bands. And you'll find supplemental materials within those. Um, and these all are hyperlinked. So I'll just click on one. This is from C Palms. Uh, it'll take you directly to that particular lesson that is related to lionfish. Um, here's another cute example. This is aquatic, uh, now the aquatic invaders and uh, students can walk through um, meeting different invas invasive species suspects depending on where you are geographically in the state and learn about uh, those particular organisms, et cetera. So, some really great extension activities and resources. And uh, you'll find a link to the Zoom webinar. These are run through Zoom. Um, so you can attend those sessions live and have opportunities to Q&A with a scientist and students can interact with that scientist in that way. 
But if you're unable to do so, or you have multiple classes, for example, um, not only can you watch via Zoom or YouTube, you can also find the recordings on our YouTube channel. And this is where we're going to house the professional development. So there'll be another tab here that develops this week that will be about the hydrosphere and all of the materials from this week can be found on the YouTube channel with those associated links and chat boxes. But this is the uh, example of the Into the Garden series with Mount's Botanical Garden. Wonderful things to preview. Again, all extension activities are linked here on YouTube as well. Um, the Anjari's Ocean Expert Exchange with us. Our uh, scientists and residents, Alan, does some great little series uh, where he in investigates different things around the area. He's a wildlife biologist. It's really interesting. This is our science segment series where we highlight a specific standard and you hear from the scientists. These are video shorts, usually about five to 10 minutes in length. Uh, our museum 360 series, uh, Bruce has done one of these tours with us on fossils in the Fossil Hall exhibit, Florida Fossil Hall, which is fascinating. You heard about that fossil collected uh, up in Montbrook by one of the Escambia teachers. Uh, Earth Echo International, we have a little series that we've done with them on youth in action and civics. And then of course our Friday Q and A's, which often have an animal featured or other various topics, um, they're fascinating. So this is the YouTube channel. It's a great for you. Um, in addition to that, you'll find, let me just click back here, back to the main screen. Click, click, click. There we go. Uh, all the K-12 professional development and resources are also housed here. And this is a great spot to look for upcoming professional developments. And um, you can also ask, access some of the past PDs uh, on this page. So just a tip to know where to look for that. And this is a big one. I'm holding off on sending out the newsletter until later this afternoon. Um, the subscribe to our newsletter feature right here, this will take you to uh, the, the landing page. And we have a wonderful newsletter that we put out monthly, once a month called Seth Spotlight. And I will just quickly show you what that looks like. Uh, I've got to just log in really quick, but it will be fast. Um, oops. This particular newsletter, um, there we go. This particular newsletter will be chock full of information. Okay, well, I won't, but I will send you a link for that. Uh, it is chock full of information on professional development, grants for teachers, grants for students and classrooms, uh, learning for students. There are um, visits from around the state. It will tell you about upcoming events and live streams that we're holding. So we'll be quick to get that newsletter subscription out to you too. And I highly encourage you to uh, sign up just to be in the know. Um, this is a great example of that with over nearly 200 app 280 applicants for this particular PD and limited space due to lab bandwidth we weren't able to take all the teachers that applied. And if you know about it first, you can get in there and make sure and ensure your spots for things like the PDs. And then finally, the Facebook group, which has been all the talk. Um, we want to make sure that you are, uh, if you are a social media person, that you are putting the hashtag SEFS, S-E-F-S, or hashtag Hydrosphere, so we can see all the great posts and tweets that are happening uh, in reference to the Hydrosphere PD. And those things are inside of the, um, the chat box as well. So you can click those links and just save that tab for the moment. But we will follow up with all these in an email. Um, Brian mentioned the map and you can see that live here. Our contact information is here. So when you click on our page, you can find our phone number and our email should you ever lose us, which hopefully you won't. Um, all of that information is found there. And then at the very bottom, is an awesome blog that we try to update with a few different stories, at least a, a story or so a month. And these are great inspiration to see some of the wonderful things happening around the state from awards being uh, disseminated to the PDs themselves or visits which might inspire. So we wanted to make sure that you know where to access all of this great information and material. And again, the uh, bit.ly, the shortened URL for the website is uh, on Brian's slide deck there or on the back of his virtual uh, screen, but it will also be in the chat box and it will fo we'll follow up with an email to everybody. So I wanted to talk really fast. I know I spit that out quickly, but we were running short on time. And at this time, I wanna introduce you to two teachers who have been part of our program an active part of our program now for some time. In fact, um, Monica Mormon and Karen Bruning, one teacher, Karen is from Escambia County and Monica is from Broward County. 
And Escambia County was one of our pilot counties the very first year we started. We had done a kind of a test pilot in five counties uh, geographically placed around the state. But Broward County was not one of those at the time. And Monica was a teacher who quickly found us and was anxious to get started with the program. And when things opened up after COVID, we were so excited to have her be on board as well. They are both SAF Superstar Award winning, uh, winners. Um, they have won a financial uh, uh, gift as, as well as some little things like the t-shirt you have and uh, a beautiful plaque about their uh, work with SAF. So I'm going to turn things over to them to talk about the project that they've been part of and the long-term partnership that they've had with their scientists. Um, ladies, I'll let you all take it away. And if someone wants to share screen, by all means, go for it. Hello, everyone. Uh, Stephanie, can you hear me? Hi, Monica. <laughs> sure can. Okay. Whoops. Present. Minimize here. Okay. Take it away, Karen. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited that you guys get to take part in this wonderful training. Um, this has really been amazing for us. So um, we did a project with the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure with Dr. Gurley and Dr. Waysom called Tipping Towers. We originally called it Hurricane House, but Tipping Towers stuck. <laughs> so, um, and that involves doing some work with a wind tunnel, which was amazing. And just to make sure, like the, these were our mentors, right, Karen? Um, we had two UF professors, uh, Dr. Curtis Gurley, who's a UF professor, uh, and also Dr. Jeremy Waysom, who's an instructional assistant professor in the Department of Engineering Education at UF as well. So um, I'm Karen Bruning. I am about to enter my sixth year teaching at Pensacola High School. Um, I have um, a total of I guess that would be seven total years teaching. I taught two years like a long time ago. Um, I teach mostly ninth grade um, students, but I do have a variety of students in my classes and it's about 130 students. Um, and there was a hybrid setting with about 30% of them vir virtual and also about 30% of my students were ESE. I am Monica Mormon. I am a fourth grade teacher. It's a general ed classroom. And I think it's important to stress that this content is totally doable with general ed kids with a range of abilities. Um, I work at Central Park Elementary in South Florida. Uh, at the time of the project, I had 22 students uh, in a hybrid setting. Eventually, 14 of them were face to face, eight were virtual, but we started 100% virtual for a long while. Um, I am also including my Twitter if you're interested in just um, looking back at um, my project, you know, I was uh, report, you know, recording the progress. So it's an FYI if you're interested. I also wanted to thank Stephanie and Brian very quickly for inviting Karen and I today. Um, it's so exciting to be among you teachers who are here during your summertime. Um, I'm sure you're science fanatics like we are, Karen. Uh, so I feel like I'm in a group of like-minded individuals. Um, I also wanted to give a brief shout out to a few familiar faces. I see Maritza, hello Maritza, um, and I see Bianca. So exciting to have you here. Um, so what were the learning objectives of the project? Um, well, first of all, um, and I will be very vulnerable with you because I went through the same process last year. Um, when I was placed in a group with Karen, I was a little bit apprehensive. Karen, I don't know if you knew, uh, but you know, <laughs> here you have this engineering high school teacher and here I am with my little people, for graders, general ed. Um, will I be able to make it work? And yes, I was. Um, so um, there's just so much room for flexibility. You can really take away what you need for your uh, particular group of students. So fear not. Um, our ultimate goals in the projects were to um, basically explore principles of designing buildings for wind loads and to design an optimal house that would withstand hurricane force winds. And during that process, we would, of course, go over the uh, concepts of slipping versus tipping and a variety of other uh, concepts that go along. Um, bottom line, our essential question was to answer how can we design a house that can withstand hurricane force wind? So there's really a variety of standards that you can cover with this from math to um, English with technical writing. Um, and you can also talk about weather. You can talk about physics principles with this. We just found 
this wasn't even all of the standards that we found that we could apply to this particular project. <clears throat> and I know I used a variety of math standards as we were discussing perimeter area. Uh, and as you mentioned, reading as well, reading a technical text, using multi resources to learn about the concept. So this, these are just science standards alone, but there was a variety of others that we used. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and of course, this was a multidisciplinary project. Um, in my case, um, and again, as you plan today, thinking about how you can use the content you're learning about in your project, think about something you're already doing in your classroom. In my case, I was um, doing a big unit on hurricanes at DBQ, why are hurricanes so dangerous? And I felt like this would be such a perfect addition to this um, theoretical component, right? Uh, so um, what I've used was besides my DBQ, um, I used a variety of fiction materials, Blown Away, or I Survived Hurricane Katrina. Um, I also used a lot of nonfiction resources using National Hurricane Center. I remember uh, printing out that hurricane tracking map uh, because again, the project felt perfectly time-wise uh, during the period of you know September, October, November, where we have a lot of hurricane action going. Mm -hmm. So my students were um, tracking hurricanes and we were looking at uh, learning about coordinates. Uh, I mean, so many concepts, um, but this was one of the sources I used. I know some of us used CommonLit to um, add to that content component. And Karen and I are using different weather STEM kids, right? I know you're using, and you can Karen and talk a little bit about this. You're using the weather STEM data. I use the weather kit from Civil Air Patrol, and um, I strongly encourage you to join it. It's for about $30 a year, I think. Uh, you end up with a, a multiple of resources among them, this weather kit. But Karen, do you want to talk about that? One right, so weather STEM is actually a Florida company and they have, uh, they developed it in reference to um, trying to keep football players safe. So they have a weather STEM station, I think on every high school stadium in the state. And they have a lot of them across the Eastern US and they're working their way across to the Western US. And these are free and they archive it. They, have, they, they record data every minute. They have um, a picture of the sky every minute um, and they'll archive it. So most of them have been in place at least two years, I think, but right now. And so it'll go back, um, you can go back data wise and it'll play through the whole day and it'll show you how the temperature changes, how the wind speed changes. It's really a wonderful resource. And that data is free to get. You just have to go to weather, I think it's weatherstem.com and um, you can just find, uh, they have it on most of the professional football stadiums, all the college football stadiums, but mostly what they had, the reason they did it is because they were having um, football players that were having stress related illnesses because of the heat stress. And so they actually have sensors in the field too. So you can tell when, like just because way up here where the weather station is, it's okay. On the field, it could be much more humid and much more, um, much hotter. And so they have it where they have the, the flag warning. If it's a black flag day, then the, then the coach can make a decision to be a bit safer about the training. So it's a really wonderful resource. <clears throat> and so for our materials, we chose, um, we were gonna build some prototypes with cardstock and um, possibly Lego sets. And then we ended up probably not doing that, but, um, we made them out of balsa wood. So the really thin, you know, those thin airplanes, that balsa wood and um, some wood sticks and some wood glue. And we gave them, we wanted to have them do notebooks for it and um, possibly taking notes in the Cornell fashion and using some virtual meetings since we did have some virtual students and we wanted to meet with those, the professors and that was all, all virtual too. And what was really wonderful about that is I have six different classes. They zoomed, zoomed into each one of my classes. And so scheduling that was kind of um, crazy, but they did zoom in live. I didn't have to record it and show it. They zoomed in live to each one of my classes, which was really, really cool. So this was our initial plan. Remember, Karen, and we were going back and forth. Should we remove the items we change? And we decided, no, actually, we wanted you to see that um, this was the original. And then we made so many modifications along the way, uh, largely due to COVID reality. Uh, I guess I, I didn't anticipate that my students would be virtual for so long. 
um, and there were challenges that came from that. Um, but I think it's important to know that uh, this plan is can be so flexible and fluid, and you just change it as you go. So um, obviously, uh, we use the 5E model uh, to create our lesson plan around. Um, and again, remember, this is a very generic one because it had to be applicable to both high schoolers and elementary students. Um, and then we just took it from there, right, and individualized it for our needs. Um, the timeline changed as well, and that's fine. I mean, my project took much longer, but it didn't take away from the joy of doing it, the excitement of doing it. So um, it's a it's a win-win for me regardless. Um, I don't know, Karen, were you able to stick to the original timeline? Um, mostly we were able to do our first wind tunnel test before Christmas break. So mm -hmm. that was, that was pretty cool. Okay. So, um, again, you start with the engage component, so it could be different in many cases. In my case, it was that introduction to DDQ, just talking about the phenomenon of hurricanes in local, in South Florida. Um, and then we took it to more, uh, physics related topics, you know, the center of gravity, stability, um, Karen, I don't know how far you went with that. I know Dr. Gurley's presentation was helpful in my case. Uh, he created a beautiful presentation about these concepts for my students. So I appreciated that support, Karen. And then I, um, I did a couple of demonstrations with them. So you've heard of, um, if you put your head on the wall and try and pick up a chair under you, girls can do it, but guys can't because their center of gravity is lower. It didn't quite work very well. I had like one girl and one guy that could do it, but they were very tall and very lean. So, but then I had a bunch of football players too. I'm like, okay, so if you don't want to get knocked down, what do you do? They're like, well, you get low. I'm like, there you go. They're like, oh. So it was it was kind of a fun, a fun day just doing a little bit of demonstration and talking about that. And then in the explain component, um, again, you would pull anything you need from uh, if you're elementary like me from uh, other subject areas, in my case math, I really had to go over the concept of area uh, because I guess we forgot to mention that uh, our project had specifics. Students had to follow um, certain criteria to build their towers, right? In terms of the surface area, in terms of the height, the width. So uh, just going over these components with my students was the bulk of the activity here. And again, it took us longer than one week. Um, then we went to the building phase, the prototype building phase. So again, going over the uh, concept of uh, engineering design process, which can be new for some students. Um, in my case, I had to totally redesign this piece um, because every single student in my class wanted to build. So the original concept was to do it in groups. Uh, and you know how groups work. Um, you only have a handful of students ultimately building. Um, and I didn't want to deprive my students of this experience. So I ended up ordering more supplies packing them individually, meeting with my uh, virtual students after school, giving them the supplies. Um, so everybody had a chance to build their own prototype. Um, students in class, my face-to-face -face students, decided, uh, some of them did it individually, some of them did it in groups. I left it up to them. Um, now, originally, I thought that we would use cardstock with elementary students, right, Karen? Remember the conversation? Mm -hmm. But they were so good with balsa wood, so good with the wooden sticks. So why not? Why deprive yeah. them of this opportunity? So we switched yeah. to wooden sticks and balsa wood. Now, because I had that the hybrid model, I wanted all of my students to know what's going on, right? Um, so we used Flipgrid. Every student recorded their um, testimonial, I guess, showing their power using the criteria that we designed for the, the prototype and share what they built. So that was cute. I was able to see everybody's design. Um, children were also in, uh, encouraged to post critiques so they could um, post their verbal responses on Flipgrid as well. Um, just saying what they like or what they thought could be improved about the prototypes. And then and evaluate, my, go ahead, Karen. Sorry, with my hybrid kids, uh, some of them actually came to the school and picked up kits so that they could do this at home and then bring it to the school. So it was pretty cool. I ended up with 34 towers. So I think it's so impressive that despite the challenges of COVID, right? We were able to make it work. Yeah. It was, everybody had a chance to participate. Oops. And then in the evaluate component, I was like, and we used, we created the rubric, right? We had some pre and post assessments about just the concept of hurricanes and some physics. Um, we had some vocabulary quizzes along the way. Uh, and also the reports. I used it at least, Karen, as part of the grade. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I had, um, you can see my quote here, it went really well. 
And I divided mine up into, I had some traditional classes and some honors classes. And then I had my engineering kids because I'm the sponsor of our engineering club. And so I had three prizes. We had these really great PHS STEM shirts that um, our Science Olympiad team was selling as a fundraiser. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> so I, I grabbed three of those. And so um, our winners were actually for our traditional kids was an English language learner. And she's only been here, she's been here less than a year. And so we were able to even get it across to her and she was able to understand the design process enough that her tower would stood wind more than the rest of her peers. And in our honors class, there was a girl who didn't want to build a tower at first. She was remote at first. She's like, I just don't want to do this. I'm like, okay, that's okay. But when she got back in class and she's like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> so her and her partner won for the honors. And then we have, you know, you'll see on the next slide, I'll, I'll show you the innovative freshman that won our engineering team won. Um, this, this monstrosity here in the middle, um, you can see a lot of golden color. That's all glue. And they tried to use a heat gun to dry the glue and it ended up working like a blister. So the top of it dried and it was still all squishy. It was so weird, took it forever to dry. <laughs> but um, these are some of the designs as they're going through. Um, I even had, if you look at, um, if you look at the very bottom, the lowest picture on the slide, um that That's one funny. that one um that student was actually a really special case he sort of followed the design this was during our second iteration i let the um engineering team class they got to use the tower project as their part of their final exam and so we we built a second round of towers so this uh this is presley and he was actually he's in our ese self-contained class but he is very, very technically gifted. Like he could describe all the parts of a aircraft carrier and the, the tail hook and like the whole nine yards. So he was really, really an interesting kid. And so in order to encourage good behavior, they said, well, we have this project and if you can manage your behavior this week, you can go build a tower and have it tested in a wind tunnel. And so that did happen. Um, he actually left the school before we got the results back, but um, one of our other teachers actually knows his mom. So he was able to see his wind tunnel, his, his tower in a wind tunnel. It's just such a cool experience for him. Um, but yeah, so those are three of our winners and then our special, our special Presley Tower. Um, but the kids just had a great time. And when we were showing the videos, I don't know how it went for you, Monica, but the smack talk was huge. They were like, <laughs> oh, my tower's gonna win. Oh, that's my tower. Oh, your tower's going down. It was hilarious. I felt like I should have brought popcorn. I did for the second second round of towers. I brought popcorn and, and cups so they could get water. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a great experience. The kids loved it. Go ahead. And my kids again, um... Um, I so appreciated the support of our engineers, Dr. Gurley and Dr. Mm -hmm. Waysom, uh, who joined me twice. Um, and again, you, you see my class here at the bottom. Um, uh, Dr. Waysom was amazing at just going over the engineering design process, showing that basically anybody can be an engineer, right? Um, and just, I guess, talking about the stereotype, uh, talking about the, you know, the lack of underrepresentation underrepresented groups in the uh, engineering careers was very powerful to my students. Um, Dr. Gurley was so patient with us, again, going over the structure of the prototype, um, giving us some basics in physics. So this was a great component. Um, here you can also see uh, some of my students um, submitting their um, reports virtually through Flipgrid. Here you see my face-to-face -face students working in groups um, and working on their prototypes. Here's the picture of uh, our towers from the wind tunnel and Dr. Gurley just doing a brief in info. And I wanted to actually share it with you, if you don't mind. Stephanie, we still have a few minutes left, right? Sure, go ahead. Um, so over here, and I turn my volume on, let's see. Hi, everybody. We're in a boundary layer wind tunnel at the University of Florida. My name is Kurt. Marielle's holding the camera, you'll see her more later. And today's experiment, we're gonna take all the towers that you made, very beautiful, very colorful, and we're gonna follow your instructions on what the front is, and we're gonna place them down against this line to have something to trip over. 
And you'll see how we do this. We'll have seven or eight models lined up. And then you'll hear Scott talking about what speed or what rotations per minute the fans are running at during the videos. And you'll be able to watch the testing and watch them fall over. And we'll put the scores on them. And then we'll do the next round and the next round until we're done. Those models that had the top speeds will then do a final champions round to see if we can repeat the same results again or how far apart we are when we do two tests on the same kind of power. So that's the idea. Enjoy, have fun, and thanks for playing. So as you can see, um, it was amazing for the kids to be a part of this. Let me, let me just minimize it very quickly. Go back here. Um, so both Karen and I would like to thank Thompson Earth and System Institutes and the amazing Steph's team, Stephanie and Brian, for being so patient with us, so supportive. Uh, you really added so much to our instruction and you brought so many, help us bring so many exciting experiences to our students. So we are forever grateful. Uh, we also wanted to thank our UF partners, Dr. Curley and Dr. Waysom for, for their support. I mean, they did some additional sessions with us. Um, again, so we're so grateful. Karen, would you like to add anything? Yeah, because I know Karen, it's you have been such a great... Sorry, go ahead. Because you also have another project that stems from this, right? You want to... Yes, yeah. This? So this can, this CEPHS project can develop into further partnerships. Um, Dr. Gurley and Dr. Waysom are willing to do this project with my students again. And I'm actually working on a, a teacher training program with them right now that they just got a grant through the National Science Foundation for. So I'm helping to develop some stuff with that this summer. So the opportunities are endless. I actually got highly effective on my evaluation this year for the first time ever. So <laughs> um, it's a big deal. Um, I'm just so excited that you guys get to uh, get to do this now and start um, and just start down this road because it's it's it can add so much to what you can do with your students and you're be, you're going to be excited and they're going to be excited and everybody wins. It's just great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks to both of you for sharing uh, your experience with everyone here. I imagine there might be a few questions, and if you don't mind sticking around for just a moment, uh, sure. we'll see if anybody has anything to uh, ask you. I do want to emphasize to everyone that this was done during this hectic pandemic where they were able to get really creative and think outside of the box and share these wonderful experiences with their students uh, in a way that probably a few years ago we would never have imagined could have happened. So. Kudos to both of you. Um, again, these partnerships and the ability to have these ongoing relationships and be able to quick call or email um, these engineers and scientists at UF is a tremendous experience for all. And I know both of you have been very avid uh, in the CEPS program and doing all sorts of things with not only these scientists, but other scientists, quite frankly, too, within the program. So thank you to both of you for sharing and for being such amazing teachers. Um, anybody have questions for either of our uh, testimonial teachers here today? I'm looking in the chat. I don't see anything specific in the chat at this time. I have one hand raise. Uh, Enith, go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, hi, how are you? Uh, thanks for sharing your experience, by the way. I thought it was awesome. I bet the students were amazed to see that whole tunnel, like, oh my God, that's my project. It sounds, mm -hmm. it looks really good. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question, uh, especially to you guys, but I, I see that you said um, the, the scientists were able to attend all six classes. Mm -hmm. So is that gonna be, because some a lot of us, I mean, that's what we have. We usually have like five to six classes. So is that gonna be possible for every single one of us? It should be. It should be. Okay. Okay. Once, I know they're talking about, we're talking about making this project a little bit bigger this year and having all the freshmen do it. So it would be 200 students oh, and three wow. teachers. And they want to have um, a big, like, in school field trip where they all go to the gym and they all build it in one day. And uh, Jeremy and uh, Kurt are talking about actually coming to the school for that day. So awesome. Thanks for sharing. Okay. So Enith, I'll just kind of second uh, what Karen's saying there. And, and 
for all of you as you are requesting scientists. Um, when we make that match for you initially and we e introduce you to your scientist, if you already haven't been working with them through the PD, um, you will want to communicate with them and right away solidify kind of a, a plan for a date and what the logistics will be for that visit and ask, you know, hey, I've got these six classes. Is it possible that we uh, arrange to have a, a visit with each of these classes? And I would say for the most part, Brian and I have, our experience has been that the scientists are very accommodating as long as they have enough, um, you know, warning and they uh, have had that communicated to them. They're usually more than willing to participate in all classes. And in other cases where maybe there isn't the ability to do that because of scheduling, again, we've gotten creative with recording a session or doing other things to make uh, available the time for those students to ask their questions of the scientists at another time. So um, great question. Stephanie, uh, it looks so one question from Jenny. I think it's an important Go point. Go for it. You found it. <laughs> asks, I don't only teach science. No, I teach all subject areas and forth. And you're asking how is it possible to balance this with the tight timelines of content? Such a good point. Um, it is challenging, but if you make it multidisciplinary, so like I said, I was able to um, cover uh, reading uh, different types of texts, using multiple resources to learn about the content, um, uh, nature of science uh, so, and math. So. Um, Everything that I'm supposed to do was there in it, right? I just maybe uh, adjusted the pacing, but it was doable. And then there's Thank you, Monica. That's such a good point. There was a question about administrative support. And uh, my administrators were very supportive. And it was actually my assistant principal's idea to make the bigger version of this project for this coming year. I know that there's um, several of our counties that have like every single day planned out for them, like ahead of time. So I don't know how they would work that in, but that might be something that you address. You would probably definitely have to get administrative and probably county approval on that one. So I am going to ask um, both of you if you're able, because I think there might be some more questions in the chat box. If you can answer those within the chat box, we are for time going to move into our next presentation. Uh, Brian, I'll turn things over to you to make introductions in case there's any sharing for screens, we can get that set up and rolling. We should be all good to go at this time. So our next presenter is going to be uh, Dr. Jatla Antar, um, who is going to share all about sort of the work that he does with water in his lab, give us a little bit of the um, you know, run around with the data that he uses, how he uses it, and how he uses it to uh, solve problems. Um, and then, um, you know, the implications of that. So at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Um, Dr. Jutla, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. So uh, my name is Anthar Jutla. I am Associate Professor of Environmental Engineering at the uh, University of Florida. Um, we have um, a lab, um, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a director of a lab, it's called the Geohealth and Hydrology Lab. Our lab focuses on issues of water as it relates to human health, and it specializes in uh, the predictability of infectious diseases. Um, infectious diseases uh, could be waterborne, vectorborne, airborne, uh, and we also basically um, uh, work on core um, water principles, like how water flows and how water basically interacts with humans, and then what are the issues that the world is facing. Um, so we have a program. Um, so we moved here from uh, West Virginia University, uh, and then we are still trying to build a program for K through 12 kids. Um, so I'm going to share my experiences uh, that I had with the um, elementary, middle, and high schoolers uh, back when I was in West Virginia. Um, and then uh, we would be uh, willing to take questions after that, or like if you guys would like to uh, um, contact uh, me, uh, then that, that would be totally okay. Um, but we are looking for like expanding our, uh, our water knowledge to uh, schools, especially through K-12 education, uh, kids in, uh, in, in Florida. So um, most of our work is funded through NASA. And uh, one of the things that we do when we go to schools and when we basically interact with kids is we ask them a very simple question. We ask them, 
um, what does NASA do? So um, everyone has heard about NASA, especially the kids. And then basically everyone, uh, not everyone, I'll say like 80, 90% of students will say, oh, well, they send satellites to moon. Oh, they're sending uh, things on Mars or they're finding something in the space. And that's, that's interesting. But when we tell them that um, NASA does Earth system as well, NASA actually studies a, a big chunk of NASA's program is to study how we live on the Earth and then how basically we, uh, um, how basically we use water, natural resources, how do we move from um, uh, one place to another place? So this is all what NASA does. So, um, so that basically, so this, this, so the idea of asking this question to kids is to highlight them that um, the high tech companies, the the cool stuff that 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 NASA does or other uh, agencies do, they are concerned about the future of the Earth as well. So um, what, what do we do is like, we basically develop uh, visualization programs for kids and uh, to make sure that they understand the, uh, the water issues. And then they basically try to um, assimilate that information in form of the projects or in terms of uh, data analysis. We do help them with uh, understanding how precipitation, let's say, uh, happens in one location and how it is different in other locations. We did some projects in Africa where uh, kids were uh, interested to know that why does it rain um, less in Africa and more in uh, in the US. So we kind of like um, um, develop programs for them and develop maps and then interact with them that okay well this is how things work and and then then try to make uh, uh, try to make um, uh, a, a a curriculum. Uh, so that they can, if they're interested in the geophysical sciences, they basically, um, uh, they're, they're prepared to do that in their colleges. So I'm going to show you guys a video. So this video is, uh, uh, is, is, is on the uh, uh, flood prediction. This, is, um, th th this video was prepared by an undergraduate in my lab and with two high schoolers back in 2017. Uh, so this was um, a video that showed that how uh, Houston will look like after Hurricane Harvey. So um, uh, I, I, so my, my lab has uh, usually has like six to seven graduate students. I basically instructed all my graduate students not to help them uh, in case like, you know, in case of like serious issues, they should help them. Otherwise, let them do it. So they were interested to know that what will happen to um, Houston uh, after Hurricane Harvey lashed that area with with uh, uh, with a hundred year um, uh, floods, so as you can see, like this is uh, this is a core um, um, visualization routine. So uh, the idea here was that kids, are, uh, so high schoolers were interested to know that why people don't move from the locations that are close to the coast, and why do they basically prefer to stay near the coast, and I. Uh, and, they, and I basically told them, why don't you guys look into this idea of um, um, uh, uh, mapping the floods in, uh, in the entire uh, Houston area. So they, um, so I gave them like three lectures and then they started to building these codes. Uh, we trained them in the uh, where to get the data sets and how to get the data sets. And they produced these maps uh, in like uh, six to eight weeks. So final rendering was done by the graduate students, but they were able to show this that, okay, well, which homes are going to be under flood? So here the blue is uh, the water, which is, um, and then it shows that more the blue is, the more the, uh, uh, the, the, the depth of water is. So they were able to show like, you know, where the floods will happen, how it will happen. And then basically um, they were interested to basically then go after uh, Hurricane Arma. So after, uh, 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 and then we, we developed a, a similar technology for them uh, to basically simulate for, uh, for Florida. So this is the Tampa Bay, uh, yeah, this is I think Tampa Bay. So, um, so we did this mapping again with the um, undergraduate students and few of the high schoolers and basically uh, ask them, okay, well, how will the Florida look like if there is 100 to 200 year uh, floods uh, that, that will happen in that, part of the, uh, um, in that part of the world? So they were able to basically um, map these things 
And it, is, it basically showed them, okay, well, what is the dangers of floods when national weather forecasting issues a warning that you need to vacate or you need to basically evacuate, then what does that mean? And if they don't vacate, if they don't evacuate, then what is going to happen? How much flood is going to happen? Which roads are going to get cut off? So this type of work that, that we show to the uh, uh, middle schoolers and the high schoolers, it's, it's quite uh, rewarding for us. And, and the reason it is rewarding is because then they start to ask questions that why water is important? Why do we think about, uh, how do we think about cities? How do we uh, think about development in like next 20, 30 years? Um, so, um, so then they, once they start asking, our idea is to basically not be prescriptive, but be descriptive. Okay, well, there can be multiple um, solutions, but if you ask the right question, then basically um, the solutions will come from, from there. So the asking questions is, is, is more important. So rest of everything is like tools and then they can use that tools to uh, get the water and water systems up and running. And then, and then this, this applies to like, so they can, they can use these, uh, the, the, the information that we use, um, the products that we develop in our lab anywhere in the world. So um, uh, for example, like one of, um, a uh, few of the undergraduates were interested to know where the um, uh, cholera, why, why uh, Africa has so much cholera and why, uh, why can't we do anything with the satellites and uh, why can't we basically see that where, um, why can't we basically, uh, I, I'm so sorry. Why can't we basically um, figure out that that uh, people are not getting fresh water? So, uh, so we basically uh, we have a model. We gave them the results and we said, well, why don't you use the Google Earth, overlay the risk of cholera on Google Earth, and, and find out the water bodies that where where they're getting the water systems. So um, I'm going to show this one again. So in this one, so this is the product that was generated in our lab. So the red ones were the regions of high risk for, uh, for cholera, which is a waterborne infectious disease. It's, it's, a, it's a very serious disease. Uh, um, the tropical world um, has, has much more potential to be infected by this, uh, this, um, uh, this pathogen, the vibrios. So, we were inter so they were interested to know like where are the water sources. So what they found out is that, well, if the risk is high, then most likely people are getting water from this river. And this river will have a reservoir, which means that this is where the, uh, they're going to get some, uh, some water system. So they ultimately pinned down to, uh, uh, to, a, to a very specific location where they were getting the water systems. And, and then they basically start, um, try to formulate this idea that, okay, well, if they have to get the safe water, how are they going to transport the water? How are they basically going to build the infrastructure? Or is there a possibility that, that, um, that there can be uh, some innovative ways to um, uh, to go through um, uh, to, to, uh, for the technology transfer that we have in the U.S. and can be applied to the to, to African region. So they they started asking like all kinds of questions. Our idea here was okay. Well, you should ask more questions because if you ask more questions, then basically that's that's where the solutions are going to come. So this is the second type of projects that we did uh, with, with our K through 12 folks. The third one that we did was um, uh, with elementary school students and elementary school students, um, we, um, we engaged them through uh, Legos. And uh, the, um, the idea here was um, we wanted to, um, uh, so we gave them like a bunch actually each, uh, we had like six, seven teams. Each team had like five, 6,000 pieces of Legos, uh, all kinds of uh, colors and uh, plants and trees and dogs and all kinds of things. And we asked them, okay, well, design a perfect city for us. So this was grade uh, fourth and fifth. So we asked them, okay, well, what do you want uh, to be in your cities? Um, uh, do you, how many houses you want and build an ideal city for us. And they started building, it was a group of five students and five groups, and then they started building um, their, their houses and plants and trees and all those things. And um, then we basically intentionally flooded the entire network. And we said, well, see, if there is a flood, the entire thing will be, um, will be colla will collapse. How will, you, how will you figure it out? 
Then they started to think about, okay, well, now we have to raise the buildings. Now we have to basically uh, have more ponds. We have to have more rivers. We have to have uh, a, a, a way to basically channel the uh, water systems out of the cities. So this was quite rewarding for us uh, coming out from the uh, fourth and fifth graders. So um, the, uh, the last piece that I would like to show you guys is that uh, we train students with the real-time data acquisition as well. So this is the uh, NASA's Giovanni data, data platforms. We guide, uh, this is specifically for high schoolers. We guide them through, um, through data process and data, um, data acquisition uh, portals as well. So sometimes like they, they, they would like to do projects on what, what's the, what, what would be the air quality in a particular location. So we basically um, uh, work with a few of these teachers, um, uh, high school teachers, and with the students and then help them get the data sets and, uh, and, and then analyze the data sets uh, and then basically make, make some uh, models out of it. Um, when we're working with the high school students, it's, it's uh, extremely important for us to have a direct contact with the teachers because that's where the communication happens uh, more effectively rather than us going to schools. And then we do go to schools, but uh, um, sometimes um, our time is, is, is a little bit, um, we need a little bit advance notice. So uh, kids uh, are always in hurry, they are, okay, well, I need this data tomorrow. So uh, that, that sometimes we have to basically um, um, manage through that, that, that stuff. And that's why um, including teachers into this dialogue is, is always helpful. With this, I'll stop here. So, um, and um, uh, Stephanie, Brian, how do we proceed now? Sure, thank you, Dr. Jetler. Um if you all have questions for Antar, please uh, raise your hand and let us know. I do see one in the chat box. Uh, one of the teachers is asking if the simulation software that you were showcasing today, is that something that's accessible via a link that they can share with students to really show uh, some of these tremendous things happening over time? Yeah, it's, it, it's available through our uh, uh, website. I will put a link um link here and and there are other videos as well that, that we produce and we sometimes like we do get requests that uh, um that they are looking for like floods in a particular location in mountains and all those things so we do um we do basically um uh, um we do that um we do uh, honor those requests as well so if you guys will go here um and this one so in the research section uh there will be like flood forecasting covid and and higher epidemiology and and all those kinds of stuff so um i'm gonna throw that in the chat box right now oh i'm actually okay so here we go Okay, so that's the page that you were just looking at. And then again, as Antar mentioned, if you hit under research, you'll see waterborne disease, uh, flooding forecasts, et cetera. And then I think Carla put in the Giovanni page, the Earth Data page from NASA in there as well. So you guys can find that uh, in there for your, uh, your search. Yes. So Giovanni data sets are, are, um, are easy to use platforms. Um, if, uh, for example, uh, so uh, there was another project that we were involved in. It was called the Mosquito Mapper. So Mosquito Mapper is is based on a citizen science project. So what, uh, and this is this was more in the Mid Atlantic region rather than in Florida, which I, I just don't know why it was not in Florida. So uh, this this Mosquito Mapper um, was based on this idea that kids will. When they're playing, they have cell phones, they will basically go and if they find mosquitoes, they'll click the photographs. And once they click the photograph of the mosquito, then they will upload it on a, um, through an app. And this, this data set directly goes to the NASA um, uh, guarded space center. And then basically somebody will tell them, okay, well, if this mosquito in their neighborhood, is this mosquito dangerous or is this mosquito not dangerous? So um, usually I think the turnaround time was like five, six minutes. So, um, and then kids, kids really liked it, but, uh, I, um, but I don't know why that program, uh, we'll find it out. Uh, we were starting that program here as well. 
so we'll find out like you know why, how uh, how can we engage that citizen science program um, here in um, in in Florida or Gainesville region as well. So uh, I'm going to um, uh, put this link here and um, and if you guys um, if if this uh, teachers are interested in this program, uh, let us know. We will be more than happy to work with you guys to get this thing, um, this thing up and running here in Florida. Uh, it, it helps both ways. It helps us because it gives us the uh, a data that that is otherwise very expensive to collect. Uh, you have to have the mosquito, uh, the traps, and all those kinds of stuff. It also gives us this idea that where the geocoded locations of where the mosquitoes are or where the mosquitoes are likely going to go. So, so it, it helps both ways. And it also teaches kids that, okay, well, what these mosquitoes look like. Yeah, this is such a great example of community science or citizen science and, and opportunities for students to engage in authentic science and data collection and to share that data where it's truly benefiting the scientific community and research and, and innovation is being gleaned from that uh, data collection. So great resource, great tool. And it's awesome that Antar and his uh, staff are willing to connect with us to uh, help kind of unroll or, or roll out, I should say, this type of community science project if you're interested. Um, there looks like, let's see, there's a clarification question from Mary Lynn in the uh, chat box. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Mary, I will get back to you on that. Maritza, um, she says this affects us so much. She's in West Broward and she gets really bad mosquitoes. And I know that there's a, a Lee County teachers in here too. And the mosquito group from Lee County is extremely active in the district with uh, mosquito curriculum. There's some great ways of introducing that type of content and doing uh, cross disciplinary uh, or multidisciplinary type of lessons where you're uh, connecting the science with other subject matter. So great, great tool and resource. You're right, Maritza. Excellent. Any other questions for the group here? Um, uh, Stephanie, let me show you something here. I forgot. Sure. That as well. um, this was, um, Yes, so we um, sometimes um, uh, some high schoolers they um, they were interested to um, through some uh, I think there, it was a program called Develop Program. They wanted to travel to um, uh, to I think uh, um, uh, to, to see like you know where the water, how the water systems look like in the developing world. So we do take those students as well. Um, I'm trying to find out if uh, um, if, if there is anything there. So we do um, we do also assist in, and that was done through Engineers Without Borders program. So they do encourage um, high schoolers to basically be part uh, or actively engage in um, in the discussions uh, with with them. And, um, and then let's see like, you know, where, um, where, where things are, yeah, okay. So I'm going to share the screen again. So, uh, I'm gonna try that again. Antar, there's a question from one of the teachers, Avra is asking, do you know if sterile mosquitoes have been released in Florida? Um, so we are not mosquito experts. Uh, we will find it for you. I don't believe it has been done, but, uh, um, but if somebody is really interested in it, we will have we have connections, and we'll put you in contact with those folks. So, um, so I'm going. So, uh, uh, Stephanie, can you see the screen share? We sure can. So this is the, the, the this is the uh, photographs of like you know some of the Lego camps that we have organized in the past. So these are the cities, and like you know the uh, the blues were the rivers and pools and all those kinds of stuff. Um, we also, so with the Mosquito Mapper program, um, we also installed rain gauges in the communities. So, uh, so this was like a weather station. So basically kids, we installed it and then we basically, we, 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 um, um, they, uh, we developed a program for teachers where they were 
um, uh, where we gave them instructions on like how to calibrate, validate, and then uh, collect the uh, weather parameters. So, so that like they can tell students, okay, well, how do we collect the data sets? How do we analyze it? Why did we get more rain? Uh, why the temperature differences are high? So we do have these kits as well with us. Um, uh, these are again, like at no cost to any school or any, any communities. These are done through NASA's outreach program, which we can put you guys in contact with. So we did um, this, we implemented this uh, program in, in an elementary school, if I, if I remember. This was done like uh, six, seven years ago and these uh, data collection centers are still running in, in, in West Virginia. So we, we can also help you guys uh, build this, uh, uh, this type of weather monitoring systems as well. And again, like if there, are, there is a need, then we can always come and uh, um, assist you guys in this one as well. Thank you. Great questions, y'all. There's some folks asking about Lego sets and it looks like a bunch of people hopped right to it and shared some uh, really good resources for uh, grants and, and obtaining sets. And I just might mention also that when there are scientists uh, at UF or any other academic institution that we're working with who have a project where perhaps Legos are something that would be a, a part of that in a classroom setting, oftentimes this sort of material would be budgeted in to those grants. And so teachers that are directly affiliated with that particular scientist and their project, they would often be getting sets of Legos or there's instances where uh, we might have sets of things such as Legos that could be borrowed. Uh, we don't have a set right now, but that, that's just saying hypothetically, if this is something that becomes of interest to teachers, it's something that we can acquire, I'm sure. So um, yes, yeah, Stephanie, that's a great point. We, we do have, so our grants have funds to to um, to purchase Legos and all those kinds of stuff. Uh, again, like uh, whatever we do in our lab, it's so our lab has a heavy component on, on research. But we we wanted to make sure that the kids know what we are doing, and then, then a simple language in which like we can teach them. So um, if there is an interest specifically in Alachua County, uh, it will be difficult for us to go uh, outside uh, yet but uh, we can think about it. But in a lot of like, if there is a school that is interested in it, so we do have Legos and we do have uh, those capabilities and we can work with uh, your folks and then get, um, get it up and running. That sounds great. Yeah, we've done kind of a, a locker system, a checkout system with things from um, 3D printed fossil teeth for certain labs. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the other things that we've done where we've sent sets out for different things. Um, 360 cameras went out to teachers as part of a wetlands PD that we did. Uh, so those types of things can be borrowed um, and then returned upon completion. So great, great feedback there in the comments. I like repurposing too, this is awesome. Yes, I've got another comment here. Yep, single use plastics, that's right, repurpose. Well, thank you, Antar, for being with us here today. It's exciting to see these really cool applications in hydrology and all of the various connections from agriculture to seagrasses and coral reef systems to uh, epidemiology, the spread of disease and how we can prevent things from happening and looking at simulations and forecasting and these really cool software programs that enlighten us for uh, things that we can do to make changes. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just going to double check that I haven't missed any questions here. I think we're good. It looks like we're good. And if you do, um, we have all this information handy and we're happy to uh, put you in touch. So thank you, Anta, for being with us today. We appreciate that. Thanks. I am going to share, um, I think we're now getting ready to break for lunch and I'm just going to see if I can pull up the uh, agenda. Brian, if you've got it handy or the slide handy, we're going to break for lunch and come back at 1230. The same link you're in now. So if you want to shut your camera off and, uh, you know, keep things muted, we will return to this link at one o'clock. We're going to put you into your breakouts with your individual lab groups. And there was a comment uh, made from someone asking about requesting the scientist for your particular lesson plan writing that you're doing uh, starting today. Uh, the answer in short is yes, we still want you to fill out a request to scientist form. Anytime you're having a connection with these scientists, be it your lab group specifically in the afternoons, or perhaps one of the other scientists that you're meeting along the week, 
um, that particular form helps us track which schools, how many students, which scientists are having these interactions. Um, that's helpful for staffs and our programming and uh, continuing and building and growing that program. But it's also really important for our scientists. And this is how a lot of times with broader impacts and outreach, they get the grant funding to do these wonderful projects and research uh, things and share them with K-12 uh, pipelines. So um, please do fill out that form and we can make sure it ends up in our database and we can track things and also be there for helping with any logistics um, or whatnot. So I guess for now, we're gonna go ahead and stop here and we'll see you back at, um, at one o'clock. Is that right, uh, Brian? You got one o'clock on there? It's 12 o'clock now? Just making sure. Where do I find that form that you just spoke about? I, it's in the chat box. I will post it again in the chat box. And everybody, if you check your email, I went ahead and sent you an email with all those important links as well. So you'll find it in a few places, but I'll put it back in the chat box again. Thank you. You're welcome.